bring to order. We all rise from the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, we have several things on the agenda tonight. The first um, is Superintendent Steele is going to cover a constellation of, of topics with regard to mastery learning. Then we're going to have a section around dual enrollment and advanced placement. I actually had to put this on the agenda because as we're talking about at the SAU level, this idea of dual enrollment, I thought it would be, and just in terms of some of the discussions that we've had, I thought it would be important to um, be able to ask questions of the administration, like what's, you know, you know what are the, what are, are we going to still have advanced placement? Are we going to have just dual enrollment? What are the trade-offs? What, what are the research? We've uncovered that, that type of thing. Um, then we're going to go into a conversation around start and end times. We'll open it up for public comment at that point, and then we'll start planning for the deliberative session after that. Okay? So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Thank you. So I wanted to spend some time for the board's sake to talk through our grading and reporting specifically at the high school because we've had some challenges with our implementation. Um, and it's, uh, I suspect perhaps there's a reason why there's some people visiting us tonight. Um, so I wanted to take some time to go through and uh, talk about where we've come and where we're going around our grading and reporting at the high school. Um, so first, a grading and reporting plan should create a competitive advantage for our students. We want to make sure that our students are presented in the best light possible when they move on from high school and go on to college or wh whatever their next step might be. Um, our grading and reporting plan has to be college admissions friendly, meaning just because we are out in front of maybe many other schools or school districts, um, our college admission, our students to, uh, that apply to college are in front of college admissions officers who sometimes take little to no time to review a transcript or a report card to determine whether that student's qualified or not. So our, pro our process has to be college admissions friendly. Um, a grading reporting plan has to provide timely and accurate feedback to students, parents, and the school system about how students are performing and what they've learned in their classes. Uh, when we report out, we need to report out on both academic and non-academic topics. We know that we do that all through the, the, uh, the school system. We report on things that are academic in nature and those things that are related to work study practices and uh, soft skills that we teach our students. Um, a grading and reporting plan should provide a trajectory for students, meaning our students should be able to know where they're headed if they continue on the track that they're on. As they move through our school system and through their school year or through individual classes, they should get a sense of this is where I'm headed towards the end of the year or towards the end of my time in the school system. Most importantly, our teachers, students, and parents should understand our grading and reporting system so they can <coughs> accurately work within it and provide good feedback to our students. So some background. Um, first, we know that we have things that we measure about students and things we communicate about students. We measure things like standardized testing, NWEA testing. Um, we measure how students are doing in their classes. We usually call those grades. We even look at things like from our portrait of a graduate to evaluate how our students are growing as people beyond just their academic skills. We communicate those things through test reports, through report cards, transcript, um, and eventually in a real-time grade book with scores that parents and students can keep track of in real time, and then also direct teacher communications. It's actually one of the New Hampshire uh, ed education rules that there has to be a chance for parent teacher conference during the course of the school year. So we know we have, we have structures in place to support that as well. Um, what some folks don't know is that a competency-based system is part of the regulations in New Hampshire. Every school system is required to have a competency-based approach to school. Um, there is a wide variation in how those programs are implemented in New Hampshire, but it is nonetheless a requirement that we all must follow. And so take a second to understand what we believe a competency-based or mastery-based education system allows. Um, we measure student growth. We care most about student growth. We know we get kids of various academic abilities that come to our school system, but what's most important to us is how far we take each individual child down that path, how far they grow. 
Uh, we care about how we rank in the state and how our test scores look as on a whole, but we can't control the students we receive. Uh, we can only control how far we take them. We also believe every student deserves a challenge in their academic uh, progress. The data in our school district shows that our students in the lower parts of the achievement span are growing the most. But 40% of our students rank in the top 25% of all uh, nationally in terms of achievement. But those students are not growing as quickly because they're maybe perhaps not being given the same opportunity for a challenge. We believe every student should have a unique pathway to success in their life, whatever that might look like. Um, and that we have some assurance that students are prepared for whatever that next step might be um, in their journey. So I want to compare for a second a traditional school model and a mastery model. Um, I like mastery much better than competency-based education, but a mastery model. Um, we all know from our experience in going through school ourselves that a large part of being successful in a traditional school model is showing up, right? If you show up, do the homework, and participate, that gets you most of the way to a positive end result or a positive grade in school. But in a mastery-based system, we want students to demonstrate that they actually understand something that they didn't understand before. We want them to participate in the process. Um, we want to be able to show them, if you want to achieve a certain grade, here's the game plan. Here's what you have to do. This is what you have to do to achieve that grade at the end of the day and take out much of the, uh, the subjectivity from the process. So imagine for a second if we instead measured students' growth through our school system like this. What if we had kindergarten through grade 12 in, in a particular subject and we said, we're going to track you over time to see how you've grown through the process. And what if we ha were able to say to our students, our parents, and our community, we know where our students are based on their peers and based on standards, whether they're below target, on target, or well exceeding those targets for a particular grade level. And what if instead of reporting um, in, a, in a linear fashion, we were able to report the growth of a particular student over time? How would that change the model significantly? Well, it might look something like this, that over time we can see how a student has performed, whether they've moved up in their over time and growth and they're staying on target or exceeding it. And in fact, if we measure that way, we could even show potential for future growth and show what trajectory they're on. If we saw a major dip one particular point in time, we could, we could push into that process and figure out what's causing that uh, particular dip in time. What's interesting about measuring growth like this over time is that we already have other measures that do the same thing. NWEA reports out student achievement and growth this exact same way, whether a student is behind, above, well exceeding their particular targets. And actually, standardized testing does the same thing. SAT, PSAT, New Hampshire SAS, whatever it is, measures students and compares them based on some sort of standard, whether it's nationwide standards or something else. And what's really beautiful about our school system over the last 10 years is that everything is coming together. It used to be that uh, the standards that we teach to were not aligned to what we were doing in our school system, which was also not aligned to the standardized test that many kids took to get into college, the SAT. But over the last several years, it's all come together and is all aligned to the same set of standards. And so measuring growth in this way provides an opportunity to see how students are really performing. But yet we have to report like this because this is what the world expects and the world knows and what colleges want us to do, right? And so during this time, we need to answer the question, how do we move to a mastery approach while still meeting our objectives of providing timely feedback that's transparent, that people can understand, that's college friendly and does no harm? Well, we start by uh, understanding a couple of key strategies here, which are essentially first, Make sure everybody knows what's coming well in advance. Give, give plenty of time to prepare for changes. We know that when there's surprises, especially with high stakes things like grading or reporting, that there can't be any surprises in the process. We have to ensure no harm, meaning that when our seniors apply and they need to provide their mid-semester grades, that they're provided something that really shows them in the best competitive light and the most uh, accurate light possible. Um, we know that we need to su support our staff and make sure they have the appropriate professional development to do this well and to implement it well. And we need to focus on where students are going, the end product. And a good analogy for this is learning to drive a car. Um, the first thing any of us do when we teach our kids to drive a car, most of us, go to an empty parking lot and teach them how to let the brake pedal go and put the brake pedal back on, right? 
and we incrementally, incrementally add skills um, all in the process of getting a driver's license as the end result. Well, when we do that, if a student does well the first time they take the car onto the real road, they might have done a great job that first time on the actual road, but we're not ready to give them a driver's license quite yet, right? We're telling them, hey, you're on the right track. Keep up your practice, keep up your effort, keep learning about the laws, keep learning how the car works, keep learning the skills, and you're on track to get that end result. It should be the same in school. We should still be providing a trajectory for students showing if you keep with it, if you keep on it, you're on track to master all the things we're asking you to master. Something that else that's important is transparency. Every student, every parent should know where a student stands at any point in time and be able to understand why they stand at that particular point. A grading system has to provide that level of transparency. So going back a month, uh, the board directed me uh, with three specific things um, regarding grading and reporting. And so I wanted to report out to the board what we've done between the December 17th meeting and today to let you know where we're headed between now and the end of the school year. So uh, the class of 2023, that's this year's freshman class. Per the board's directive, um, they will use the same transcript as the class of 2022. The only difference is they'll be, they won't have semester one grades because that's part of the progress leading to the end of the year. Um, but they will have A's, B's, and C's, just like every other student. The key measurement for them is the final score, meaning just like with the driver's exam or a driver's test, you've got to pass the test at the end of the year. You've got to prove competency in our classes, mastery of our classes at the, by the end of the year. As midway through the semester, if the class ended that day and you didn't participate any longer, yeah, that wouldn't be an A because you haven't done half of the work for the class and haven't mastered half of the competencies. So that final score is of critical importance. Moving on to the class of 2024, per the board's directive, they'll have a transitional transcript, which will still include A's, B's, and C's, but their report cards, including progress reports, won't. They'll have the scores that students are used to from the middle school and from prior years. Again, the key measurement is that end of the year final score in that particular class. And again, to be clear, we will translate that into an A, B, or C that a college will clearly understand. They won't need a conversion table. They won't need a, a second document to, to understand what that means. And then someday in the future, the world will catch up to us, right? Class of 2030, tw class of 2035, who knows? Um, we will have the ability to maybe change and our transcripts will really closely align to how we teach um, and make sure that we can move away from what we do today. But we, we know that the world isn't ready for that and that colleges in large measure aren't ready to support that kind of change. Here's a, these are small, but uh, these are what the, uh, the reports look like for the class of 2023. So on the left um, shows, if you, if, and we can provide copies of these for folks, but on the left shows at the top, the A, B, or C given in a particular course, exactly what the grade is for a particular class. And then below that shows the competency score. They all relate to each other, the same information provided in different ways. Um, but uh, clearly shows uh, the student's progress in a format that both parents and colleges can understand and students should be able to understand. I should note, these are the reports that come out of our current system. We're in the midst of a change of systems, and so the formatting might change uh, in some uh, marginal way, but the, the, uh, the, the basic premise for both still remains. And then the transcript on the right, again, shows uh, scores for students in the A, B, or C format, very similar almost identical to every other class before them at Sohegan. So for the class of 2024, next year's, next year's freshman class, the current eighth grade class, a um, couple of step process. The first step is between now and really end of February of, of this year is develop our draft of what that class of 2024 transcript will look like and what those report cards will look like. After we do that, we're gonna go through a process between March and May where we gather feedback from lots of different constituencies. Um, one of those will be parent forums. We'll probably have at least two parent forums uh, at AMS for the current eighth grade class where parents can provide feedback to us about what, those, what they think of our draft transcript, what they think of our draft report cards, and give us some feedback. We have a district-wide assessment grading reporting committee that will then uh, review the, the, uh, um, the draft documents. And then ultimately, we're going to send to community council. Community council has... Um, uh, in the Constitution for Sohegan final say on what the transcript will be uh, and they'll have the chance to go through that approval process. It will come back to the school board, although the Constitution says that, the school board still needs to sign off after Community Council and after they've finalized that process. But the goal per the school board's directive is by June of 2020 
to have this whole process wrapped up and ready to go so that next year's freshman class will have had the chance to provide input, to be well informed, mm -hmm. and to know exactly what's coming um, at, before they enter the high school um, next year. So uh, believe it or not, uh, we know that there's some specific issues we have to handle, and so we've, um, we know we'll account for those in this process. How do mid-semester grades work for seniors? The mas maximum achievable score issue, how does that work when there's uh, something less than four? We know we need to open the online grading and reporting portal, which is going to happen. We know honor roll is something that needs to be in included in the process as well. So believe it or not, we already have drafts for the class of 2024 that we're working on and working towards. And you can see they're largely in the same format as, as the ones before them. So um, I would say from the last few months, what's happened is that we started down a particular road with our current freshman class. We heard a tremendous amount of feedback from board members, uh, from teachers, from community members, from students, from community council, um, that there were concerns. And so we have heard those concerns um, from folks. We have heard the concerns of the school board at the December 17th meeting and adjusted our plan. Uh, we're going to get this right because this is really critically important to us moving forward as a school system that can provide a challenge to every student, uh, a unique pathway towards success for every student, and making sure that we're doing the absolute best we can for each one of our kids. So we, we've got to get this right, and we can only get it right um, if we work with everybody involved in the process. So that's our plan. I'd be glad to hear from board members with questions, concerns, or issues. Okay. What questions do we have for Adam? Hey, Laura. Well, the motion to have semester one's grades was clearly um, not followed. What's that? The motion to have semester one grades was clearly not followed. Um, in, in what way? On the transcript. I think the motion was that we would provide semester one grades on report, on report cards. Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask, well, in the interim, can I ask one? Yeah. All right. The question I have is, so New Hampshire, the New Hampshire regs require, and they have, I forget what year that was implemented, probably like 2014, I believe. five years ago, six years ago, required us to move to competency-based education and grading. Some other schools in New Hampshire were out in front of us. The one that comes to mind is Sanborn, right? What's Sanborn doing? In, in, yeah, um, we looked deeply at Sanborn's model because they really are a model for the state. We've had conversations with them as well, and we were we we're looking at a lot of pieces around honor roll, for example. They don't calculate it till the end of the school year. Um, they are looking at instituting um, a Latin honor system similar to us. Um, there are different uh, translation points for GPA. Um, we looked at ours and looked at similar points as well. So we used a lot of their pieces. Um, I'm not sure as far as their, I can't remember off the top of my, health, how, uh, my head exactly what the transcript looks like. Um, but um, we used a lot of their model. I don't know in, uh, specifically what you were asking about, which portion of their model. Well, I mean, just all of the, all of the beats that Adam hit mm -hmm. upon, because there are, I mean, there are clearly implementation issues in the high school right now transitioning to this, um, which, to be honest, is expected with a large Im implementation like this. But my, I guess so my question is, is that if there are other schools in New Hampshire that are out in front of us, I guess the first question was, have we used them as a benchmark? It sounds like we have. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what have they learned from, and they must have hit bumps in the road along the way, what have they learned as they transition to a mastery learning model, not only on report cards and progress reports, but also on college transcripts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I can reach out and get even more detail. We reached out when we we're tackling each one of our smaller tasks as far as um, how do we handle GPA and translating a GPA and, um, you know, uh, what type of skill do they use for their GPA and so on. Um, but we can look bigger picture with them, too, to try to get more information. Can you go back to... Um, keep going back. 
Yeah, right there. So for the class of 20, and maybe this is getting too much into the weeds, and I know we're going to go through a, a lengthy process of getting feedback, but if we're reporting out on progress scores, you know, A, Bs, and Cs, but then we're going to translate that to A, Bs, and Cs, and then we're going to translate again to a number GPA. So when, we, when we're reporting out to students and, and parents, on the report cards for progress scores and numbers, is it going to be easy for them to understand how the, those scores will eventually translate to ABCs? Because that's what's going to be on the transcript. Yeah. Do you know what I'm I, I think I know what you're asking. The students are going to get a, you know, a 3.5, mm -hmm. but their eventual transcript is going to be Minus, like, I, I don't know. So yeah. I guess, so I the want, I want to make sure we're being transparent that they have scores, but are they going to be able to know what that score is eventually going to mean in the end? Yeah. So um, what we're planning on doing, and it's hard to see from this slide, you can see that um, for those of you that it's clear on the bottom is the course score. At the top shows the conversion from the course score to the letter grade. Okay. That letter grade is what would show up on a transcript. Yeah. So we're not translating three times, only, yeah. you know, once. But you're right, there is a different translation for the GPA. Right. Um, is the 3.5 going to be used as the average number going into the GPA, or is it going to be the letter grade that is some numerical? Yeah, number? that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that is a piece that um, I want to double check on, because we weren't planning on this initial translation back to letter grades. Mm -hmm. So when we had, um, originally when the Assessment Grading Reporting Committee had worked on it, we had looked at translating the course score for the GPA, um, which we might still want to do, but I just want to do a double check okay. on that to make sure that that's the most seamless way. Yeah. And I guess the point way. is, it needs to, the, the students and parents need to know what that score is eventually mm -hmm. going to mean mm -hmm. as far as a transcript. Yes. Um, George and then Laura. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, is there data that, um, I know we're early on in this process, but schools that have converted over to the mastery based system, is there any data on how the students performed, whether on standardized testing or the type of schools? Is there any empirical data you could point to that show you know, the impact transitioning to the system has had on the students themselves? Don't need to yeah. answer. Um, so we have looked at other schools, and actually I recently um, spoke with Jim about this and shared a bunch of schools across the country. There's actually um, Competency Works is a website that is um, supported by an organization that helps to support competency education, and they've done profiles of all different schools that have actually um, made that transition to a mastery learning system or a competency-based system. And um, the one that comes to mind is Lindsay Unified School District in California. Um, they were really in many accounts a failing school district. They have a huge migrant population as well as a, um, you know, somewhere in the 90% of uh, students are on free or reduced lunch. So a pretty, um, a population that comes to school with many challenges and they've completely redesigned their entire system and have turned into a, one of the strongest schools in Southern California um, because of all of the work that they've done. So many of the schools that have fully transitioned um, have been able to, they've seen deeper student engagement, um, better leadership, students taking ownership of their own learning, and much higher achievement levels. One other question. Um, so would I imagine the students that generally performed well, are we, are we seeing the same level of growth in those students? Because you would imagine mm -hmm. students that are performing the lower have a wider range mm -hmm. to go. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the question yeah, I'm no, I know is, what you do, mean. do you see the same impact on those students as well? Yeah, so it's early in our system to um, be able to answer that. And I think a lot of school districts that have already made a full transition were districts that were really struggling, um, or their students were really struggling, and they were facing many challenges. Um, so that they've moved earlier to a system like that because they felt that they needed to completely revamp, um, where we were looking at, you know, how do we meet the needs in New Hampshire to be competency-based, and what could that mean for our learners? 
So kind of a, a little different approach. Um, the biggest piece of feedback that we're hearing so far, and mostly from the middle school, um, is from teachers about how they know their students so much better now um, that they're scoring this way. They understand them as learners more deeply and understand their strengths and their weaknesses. We're hearing this a similar thing from students. Um, I had a parent share with me that their child has always struggled in math and they thought that they were just bad in math. Um, but now that they're actually scored on each competency, the student can actually reflect and say, I'm not bad in math, I do well um, you know, in statistics and in geometry, I struggle with algebra. Um, so really um, helping a student's confidence and helping them to be able to see their strengths and weaknesses and recognize that everyone has strengths and weaknesses so that they're not just giving up and on that at math. Um, so those have been some positive things that we've seen. Um, it's still a little early to start tracking that student achievement um, to, to look at what those increases are. And I know your question around um, students who might be really strong students already, how might this system help? Um, one of the things that Adam Matt mentioned is that this system actually unlocks the ability to be able to um, uh, go deeper or go farther, faster. Um, and really, if we can track a competency, we know a student has already met certain requirements and that we're able to then find enrichment for them or um, find alternate programming for those students. So it's been really exciting. Um, you might recall um, last year the um, school board allowed a, a current eighth grade student to come here um, to take math um, because he's two years ahead in math and that's what a competency-based system opens up. It allows us to say you've met all of the competencies um, and you're ready for that next course so let's go ahead and try to give you that course. Now we have to look at what's developmentally appropriate for students and how we might manage that in the larger system um, but this is what's going to allow us to move to that type of system, which is, I think, really going to meet the needs of some of our more, um, you know, our students who are higher achievers and are ready to move on for those. Thank you. Laura. I just wanted to say that, um, from my understanding, Sanborn's SAT scores have gone down, and their other standardized tests have gone down, and they're all below state average. So I'd have to look more deeply into that to be able to address that. Um, Stanford's population is a different population than ours, so it's sometimes hard to make some of those comparisons, and I would have to speak to Sanborn to find out what else might be happening at the same time that could cause that. I can't say that that is because of their competency-based approach. From the New Hampshire website, Department of Education. Yes, yeah, so that might be very true that they've gone down. I haven't looked into that. I would have to speak with Sanborn to find out why. Anyone else? Um, well, also, I have questions about the proposed transcript. I can bring them up later. Okay. I mean, I don't think this is set in stone. Uh, you, you had mentioned this is a draft transcript, correct? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, we can talk about that later. Okay. I have, I have another question, um, mm -hmm. and then I want to open it up for public comment. I want to move that up so people can ask questions. If, for everyone, um, my question is one of the one of the areas where people I think are frustrated in the high school is, for example, there'll be a course and there'll be an assignment, and um, when you have a grading system of one, two, three, four, for people who've been through a traditional like we all have, right, A, B, C, D, F, um, that too equates to what like a C minus or something like that, right? So if you have a project that you're working on and you can only get a two in it, I think a lot of parents and students are, are I think my, you know, my son used the word like they're, you know, they're freaking out because they're like, oh my God, well, I, got a, I got a C minus and I couldn't do better than a C minus. So can you explain what that is, how that works, what's going on with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the way our grading and reporting system works, um, we look at both the type of assessment that we're giving to students um, and align that to the standard. So if the standard, um, and I'll use a pretty simple example, if the standard says that you have to um, be able to multiply double digit numbers, before you can learn to multiply double digit numbers, a teacher needs to make sure that the student can multiply single digit numbers. So you might give kids a quiz or a little in-class activity that allows them to demonstrate their ability to multiply single digit numbers. Um, you wouldn't give them a three or a four on that because they're not even showing the level of the standard because the standard is multiplying double digit numbers. So you can't score them 
a four just because they got a hundred because our system you're not scoring on that same scale you're scoring against a standard so um, the teacher uh, would give that assessment make sure students have that prior knowledge that background knowledge the student is at a two at that time as soon as the student then learns to multiply double digit numbers they're given the opportunity to demonstrate that they can do that that two really gets in a sense replaced with the three and then they're given the opportunity at the end of their learning to, to maybe even go above and beyond. So the standard might not require that they multiply double digit numbers in a word problem, but the teacher might give them a really challenging word problem. Could be an extension, could be something all students are given the opportunity for, and then they could earn that for. So the way our system works, one of the biggest criticisms of some standards-based system is that you don't always take the standard into consideration and you're really making a two a C and a three a B and so forth. You're kind of translating between two worlds. And what we've tried to do is really um, institute a system that the assessments match the scale and we're really always going back to the standard and saying, have you met that standard or have you met that expectation? So just let me make sure I understand. So if a student gets a two, on assignment that's a two out of two assignment mm -hmm. the teacher then is not going to average that two with something else that could be a four it's going to be replaced as they progress through the, yes. the competency yes so our grading system does that automatically so if a student gets a two out of a two then they get a three out of a three and then they get a four out of a four they have a four it's not averaged so it's matching the learning so you've demonstrated the highest level of competency you have a four so let me just ask a follow-up then um, my follow-up then is it sounds like part of the anxiety and agita with some of our high school students stems from the fact that they don't understand what's going on mm -hmm. So what are we doing, like what, maybe this is a question for Bill or I'm not sure who, but what are we doing to communicate, like what I'm, what I'm trying to say is like you know, when you set expectations for folks, the only way those expectations work is if they understand what the expectations are. So what are we, what are we doing to help the students understand what the expectations are mm -hmm. with regard to this, this grading process? So I'm happy to have Bill weigh in too, or Kathy or Natalie, but um, let's do that. Let's have yeah. Bill. yeah. Bill, do you want to weigh in on that? Or actually, yeah, that's probably. So I, the process is really making sure first that the teachers understand what the process is, and through uh, communication with teacher into the classroom, our students at the ninth grade level progressing into the 10th grade level and eventually as we go through four years it's at that level where where teachers are explaining this process to the kids so it's, it's on, a, on a more intimate level there's not some kind of big overarching plan to sit uh, sit the students in an auditorium and explain this it really needs to be explained at the at the classroom level um, by by teachers which is what we're trying to accomplish now okay but it doesn't sound like every teacher is entirely comfortable with this well as uh, every teacher at this point in time isn't because we have had more do we have had teachers at the younger grade levels spending a lot more time in the process because they began the process and now we're rolling it through the grade levels and certainly if you if you talk to a teacher in the ninth grade versus a teacher maybe in division two that's in the eleventh grade or twelfth grade their, their comfort level with this is is different no, there's no question because they spent more time with it and have greater understanding what other questions from the board? So, uh, no, it's okay. So, thank you for that. My concern is that students' grades may not currently be ac accurately reflect their work. So, what are we doing to ensure that? Because transcripts are really important um, for all grades, but you know we have seniors that are have applied to college and juniors next year who will be applying. So I'm concerned about students' actual grades. So the teachers in the upper grade levels um, are um, that are working with course scoring, with the, with the standards, are also 
uh, have been given um, the, the authority to look at every individual student and use their teacher discretion. Uh, this is how, from what I understand, last year, which is the process we used last year with the kids. So that process is still in place for those, uh, those, uh, those students in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. That, that is how we're, we're going forward with that. There are additional professional development that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know it's, we just have to make sure that the teachers really understand this and that um, that maximum achievable scores of two out of two are definitely being replaced with three out of three and four out of four. So um, I mean that's really important because if that doesn't happen, then there's potential for for grading to be inaccurate. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure the teachers are getting professional development that they need um, and that there's time for, there's enough time for that to happen throughout this year mm -hmm. and that students have the opportunity to, um, to really be able to understand what their grades are. So, cause mm -hmm. I, I mean, being in the community, I've just, I've heard a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. out there about this. Um, this is, this is a, as Adam, as Adam indicated, this is a big and important change, and, it's, and in many ways it's a lot different than, than things have happened in, in public schools. Um, I, can, I can assure you that the amount of, of opportunity for training, I, I know where my deans are, I know where Christine is in my building, how many times, I mean, numerous times a week to making themselves available to teachers to come in and, and work on the questions and concerns that they have. So, um, and, this, and this has been ongoing. But it is a, it is a, it's a challenge. This is very different stuff f for someone who may have been working, um, you know, a, a, in a different way for, for a period of time. It's very different stuff for all of us. Um, and um, change is hard. And, and the teachers are working very hard at trying to, to get this. Uh, I commend them for the hard work that they're doing because they really are working very hard. And there are these little aha moments that occur in teachers when they figure out even the smallest thing. It's exciting because this is a, an exciting change um, for, for education, I believe. Lauren, did you have a um, We're halfway through the year. And I have a child, and so I have access to Empower. And I was sort of reverse calculating their own scores and trying to figure out how the program worked. I had a hard time linking where is there an easy way to figure out the weighting of the academic score and how the standards feed into the competencies from the assignments. So every assignment is linked to a standard or multiple standards, and you get a different score um, for every single standard. So when you look, and I'm happy to sit down with you with Empower if it's helpful for me to go through it. We're also in the process of making some videos, um, which I think will be really helpful for um, parents, and we also have students making some videos. So um, the so for every standard, there could be a set of assignments that made up the score for that standard. And then that standard feeds into the competency, and then the competency feeds into the core score. Right, but the weighting of it all and how it feeds into each other, I mean, I would have to sit and click and click and click to try to derive all this to figure out, okay, this assignment was worth this much of your grade and where it was. And from what I can tell is they've had assignments and they're going through different standards and different competencies throughout mm -hmm. the year. Some of them they haven't gone back to for so, and some of them they haven't had an opportunity to earn a four. Um, and some of them, the, the class ends, it's been end of semester one and they still haven't had an opportunity to earn a four. So I'm looking through my own child's Empower system and it's not very easy to see where the assignments feed to the standards, feed to the competencies, and that are weighted into the grades. Is there any way to make something separate from Empower to spell that out to students so they kind of had a better have a better understanding? Yeah, no, that's helpful. I can work on that. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? I do have one more before we open it up to um, the public for comment. I do have one question. So what Laura just described though Based on what you told me, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Mm -hmm. Based on what you told me, our grading doesn't work that way, though. Is that right? In other words, the concept of having an opportunity to earn a four, that's, 
It's not the, that's not the point of how this works. Is that, is that right? It's hard to answer. I mean, that we want you to give us not exactly. I mean, we want to give as many opportunities for force, but there are some standards where the way the standard is written, there's not a way to go above and beyond what that expectation is. Right. So then my question is then, I think what Laura is getting to is, and I want to put words in your mouth, but no. I want, okay. is where is the opportunity? Let me see if I phrase this the right way. The whole strategy in the school system is to develop a school system, this is going back five years when we first made the decision, to develop personalized learning pathways for every student. Mm -hmm. Part of the, the impetus for that was we had, we have students of varying academic abilities, but we also had, for lack of a better word, term, kids who really did school well, mm -hmm. who because of their age would get stuck, you know, um, and you, they couldn't move along. They'd be in seventh or eighth grade and they, there was no, They'd say there was extending learning opportunities, but they really weren't. Mm -hmm. So we're creating these personalized pathways so kids, like you said, can migrate to mm -hmm. two levels above, okay? So if we're gonna do that, then there should be opportunities for kids to hit like four gates, mm -hmm. right? So go from a white belt to a yellow belt to a green belt to a black belt to a double black belt. So if there's tons of assignments where they can only hit a yellow belt, I think what Laura is asking is where's the opportunity to hit the black mm -hmm. belt? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. No, it does make sense. Right. And we're um, uh, part of the honors challenge. So when a student actually, you know, uh, students have choice as to whether they want to take the course that they're taking for honors or not. Um, many times the additional assignments when you sign up for honors challenge, many times those are going to allow you to hit that four. And again, we're looking at our entire system. So how do we make Honors Challenge you know, even clearer and even better and have it be even more rigorous for students um, and ensure that they're able to access that four? So again, we're always trying to enhance. Um, and we definitely can um, look at our Honors Challenge piece. But that is really one of the intents of Honors Challenge to be able to provide that, that next. It's always been there, that, that next challenge for students who are ready for it. But I, can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead. Part of that's on us as a school system, though, to map that out for students. At the beginning of a course, for a competency-based system to work, a student should be able to see, for me to get this particular score or grade, I have to do X, Y, and Z. That's got to be clearly articulated and laid out at the beginning of the class. So there's no mystery in the middle of the class, and certainly there's no consternation when we're opening the report card at the end of the year, right? There should be no surprise. It should be laid out clearly and, and very well articulated. And that's something we can improve on, mm -hmm. if I'm being honest. That's something we can do better. Um, but that's part of us That's part of us learning and growing as well. But remember, this is different than, I have to say, imagine if the inverse were true. Imagine we had a mastery-based system, and we said, no, no, we're going to change that out. Instead, we're going to say, if you show up to class and raise your hand and participate and do all your homework, you're guaranteed a C or a B minus just for doing those things before you've learned anything. That would sound so crazy to us. Right, but that's exactly how the game works now. If you participate, if you show up, if you turn in the projects with a mediocre effort, you can skate through school, especially if you have above average intelligence. Right? Um, how many of our students do we know that show up, do the minimal amount of effort, learn very little, and get good enough grades to go on to the next step? We would never change to that model from what, where we're headed. We never would. We want to ensure that students are actually learning, understand what they learn, can demonstrate it, and prepare them whatever they need to do as their next step in life. Um, and so it's, it's, but I go back to my first point, it is critical that every one of our classes, our students can map out to get the grade I want, this is the, what I have to show competency in, right? That's gotta be clear, transparent. Any other questions from the board? Okay, I'd like to open it up for public comment. Here's how it's gonna, it would work, if you have a question, Raise your hand, come to the podium, state your name, what town you're from, because I know there might be some people here from Amherst and Mont Vernon. And then um, just because of the numbers and if, if lots of people have questions, just for just a couple minutes. Can't see anybody, sorry. Um, just spend a couple minutes and then we can transition to the next person. Okay, so I see Martin in the back. Do you want to come up first? Thank you, Martin Goulet, Amherst. 
Um, so it's very clear uh, what the uh, benefit and objective of competency-based education and the scoring system is for understanding the student. I think where the anxiety comes in is we haven't, you know, the other objective that, that parents and students have is differentiating themselves for the purposes of mostly, you know, for college entry. So it has, I don't think it's, I think one of the things that isn't entirely clear is how do I, how do I as a student differentiate myself in this system? I knew how to do it in the old system. I don't yet know how to do it in the new system. So any guidance on how it takes that aspect into account could be really helpful in alleviating that anxiety. All right. Thanks, Martin. I'm uh, just for clarity's sake as well, I'm just I'm taking notes on what the questions are and then we'll try to address later or else we'll probably we'll be here for like eight hours. Um, I think Courtney was next. Um, Courtney Vore, Amherst. I just wanted to, um, I guess, ask for clarification. Christine, you mentioned that if a student earns a two and then earns a three, the three replaces the two. However, when I received the algorithm from you behind in power, that's not the explanation that I was given. So um, it's a little complicated. Oh, sorry. Right, and I just. Go back and forth, maybe. We don't. Um, oh, I shouldn't answer. Sorry. Why don't we? collect the questions okay. and we'll try to answer them all at once. Does that sound okay? Sure, that, I just have the one question, that's it. That's but, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to say I, I just fear that incorrect information is being time. given because it is more complicated than that um, and that teachers don't have control of what's going on behind the scenes in Empower. It's calculating it based on something much more complicated than replacing a score, one score with another score. So the way the system works, it's a little more complicated just because it depends on the number of assignments that a student has. So if they have one assignment, that is their score. If they have two assignments, the higher of the two scores becomes their score. So if they had a two out of a two and a three out of a three, the three is what that current score is supposed to be. Um, if there's something not working correctly, please let me know, but it is supposed to be the higher of the two scores. And then once the, uh, a third score is added, um, Empower runs three different um, really complex calculations to determine what is that best fit for a student right. and then from that determines the, the score. If a student has a two out of a two, a three out of a three, and a four out of a four, that score will be a four for that student because all of those different calculations will lead to a four. So if there's something that you're seeing that seems wrong, please let me know because we'll definitely look into it. Okay, well with that clarification that may be the case, um, I just know that from what you sent me, mm -hmm. it's much more complicated than one yeah. score replacing another score and so I think that's incorrect information to put out mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to clarify that because I think that the majority of people and I can tell you Probably 90% of students have no idea how their their grades are being calculated. Um, I, as a parent, have no access to Empower. Um, I do for my eighth grader, mm -hmm. but I don't at the high school level. My son doesn't have any access to Empower. He has no idea what grades are going into the system, mm -hmm. and he has no idea what grades are coming out of the system or how they're being calculated. So. Hi, Carrie Allen. Amherst. Um, I just wanted to say that um, my daughter is in the class of 2014, so she's 2024 20, rather, and she we've had this system since grade five. So I feel like most of us that have had a child in the class of 2024 have been used to this system. I can say there's positive and negatives to it. For me, my daughter is a, an average student, so standard-based learning for her. She's not great in math, so I know, you know, she's good at certain computations and really lousy at, you know, um, you know, word problems. So for me, breaking it down that way has been really great for us personally. However, the problem is, is if you meet the standard of three, when the report card comes home, one, you know, don't know, a parent doesn't know if they're working out of a three out of a three or a two out of a two or what the standard is. So that's not clear on the report card. So you're one, you get, your child gets the report card, comes home, and you have a two, and you're like, what in the world's going on here? And really it's, oh, oh well, you could have only gotten a two. So that's the first concern, that it's, it's not transparent, and our children have had it set for, this is our third or fourth full year now with, with this type of competency base. For me, 
when my daughter comes home and said, I met the standard and I got a three, I'm done. And I don't think that that's a great mindset. For me, my dad used to say, if you got a B minus, then it was awfully close to a C plus. So you'd work towards the A or your child got the B plus and you said, that's great in math. You brought that grade up and I can tell that that's what the grade was. And they're proud because they, they could see the movement. Right now you got a three and you're done because you couldn't have gotten a four. That's not where you are. I also want to say there seems to be a lot of confusion about how one through four works and I think some of us for the 2024 class understand. Let's pretend you have a bicycle and one is your child learns about the bicycle. You see the bicycle, you don't go on the bicycle. You have to understand what the, there's two tires, there's some gears, there's handlebars and some brakes. Okay, you have a one. A number two is you have some training wheels, you get on the bike, you're toddling along. 2.5 is, you know, when your child gets to the point where they can take the training wheels off and you're going towards the three, but you're, you're balancing, that's a 2.5 to a three. When you get to a three, you're riding the bike. You're done, right? The training wheels have come off, you're a three, you've met, the sta you've met the standard. If you're allowed to get a four, that means you're doing papa wheelies and doing some tricks on the bike. That's what that means. It's, so you cannot convert a, convert a three or a two to a B minus. That, at AMS, they said that's not a conversion. You didn't get a B, you met the standard. So technically, you have an A plus because you met the standard, but that's not... That's not the verbiage people use at AMS. So please understand, that's, you know, for the high school students, that's not, it's apples and oranges. You can't even translate. So when someone said, oh, a 2.5 is a B minus or a C plus, you can't convert like that. That's, it's French and English. So please, you know, try to understand, remember the bike, because you can't get to an A plus or a two, that's not how that is. And I, what my concern is, is we have excellent schools. Our reputation is beyond in New Hampshire for Sauhegan, you know, traditional or liberal or whatever the case may be, the school is very unique onto itself. And my fear is when you start to jam this square peg into the round hole, you take away from our students and their academic achievements and um, presenting their level of ac uh, their level of academia to the world into those universities, and I just really think you're doing yourself an injustice. I really, really do. And um, you know, just so you know, from what I've heard so far, and I'm not throwing stones because I do believe that this went through three and four has its place. I just think it needs to be translated different. Is y'all have a one? So I hope you can get to a four. Actually, uh, Heather, I think you were next. Or, no, Ooh, somebody had their head. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yep. Shannon. Sorry, Shannon. Hi, Shannon Gascoigne, uh, Amherst. So my oldest child is a fifth grader, so I'm here tonight because whatever happens now is certainly going to impact all of my kids. Um, to Carrie's point, the one, two, three, four, I haven't had a huge problem with it in the elementary grades and the middle school grades. Um, I have a big concern with how it's going to look on their transcripts. I want my kids to apply for scholarships. A lot of scholarships want a GPA. Um, <clears throat> but what concerns me most, and what I've heard tonight, is the only person who understands how to Empower works and how the calculations work, and I mean this with all respect, is Christine. Um, and I just feel like, you know, is is this the only competency-based grading system that exists? Is it the system and power that's confusing? Because, I, you know, I, the notion of direct pathways and everybody having their own, I support. But what I'm hearing, and I, again, don't have a child in the high school yet, is that the system may be the problem. So I'm just putting that out there. Are there other competency-based grading systems that may be a little more straightforward? So I'll, I'll jump in there, um, and that's a great way to bifurcate because the philosophical belief is students should progress upon mastery, but Empower could still stink, right? Right. 
Okay, and so that's a very fair criticism that we're looking into. We're not sure that Empower is the best system mm -hmm. moving forward. We're, we're using it this year. We're not going to mm -hmm. change systems mid-year. Sure. We're going to go through a process both internally and with feedback from other folks to make sure that we want to stick with Empower. But Empower is what we use to implement uh, what is our philosophical belief system around mastery-based education. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And just one more um, thought, if we do choose another system in the future. I think a lot of the anxiety too comes with none of us want to feel like our children are guinea pigs. Um, so in terms of you know the sequence of events for rolling it out and I know a lot of teacher education has taken place because um, I talk with my kids teachers regularly and they help me understand you know the grades but it's just like I feel like it should be like the board directs and then you the teachers like are completely fully on board and then the parents like I think we really skipped that parent piece between the teachers and the students um, and, and I know it's it's really tough um, but that is what I would like to see so that my kids aren't coming home and and having those like I don't know what's a two what's a so anyway thank you thanks Shannon Stephanie oh uh, sorry me Go ahead. Oh, yeah. okay <laughs> hi Stephanie Grund Amherst um, one thing I, Laura brought up on about question about the Sanborn, and I looked at the New Hampshire Department of Education site for the, um, what do they call it, student achievement, and I, I do have a concern. Um, English language arts, the proficiency w in 2017 was 53 percent, went to 54 percent, in 2019 is 50 percent. In mathematics, 2017 is 37 percent. 2018 is 30 percent, and 2019 it's 28%. So actually all the proficiency scores went down. And if, there, if we're looking at competency-based education with Sanborn, that is concerning to me. Um, so I have an 11th grader who is going to be applying to college. She doesn't have access to grades. She's an AP Chem. She's an Intro to Calc. This is very concerning. She doesn't have a clue what her grades are, especially when she gets two, three, maybe four grades on top of a homework assignment. She doesn't even know how her grades will roll up. Really big problem. Um, honors. Uh, can someone answer if honors is available to all classes? Because I know of a student where a teacher told them it is not available because she's not sure how to implement it in this new system. Therefore, we've told our high achieving students, sorry, you can't. Another big, huge concern. Um, you know, we keep hearing frustration about just empower itself, not just competency-based education. I don't think competency-based education is overall the concern. There's a huge problem with empower. We hear complaints about the teachers are getting frustrated putting grades in, things are getting deleted, upgrades are happening, things change. I think we, as a parent, we would like to know what are those issues you've, you've come across so when we show have progress reports show up. Is there anything I should be looking for that could be wrong? I don't know. But I just know that there's been problems putting it in, and I'd really like more communication, um, which is my last point, is communication. I'm not sure when. I, I understood that my ninth grader coming in was going to be under Empower, is going to be under competency-based in the, the new Empower system. I have an 11th grader. I had no idea she was going on to Empower in this new grading system. When was that decision made? And when was it communicated to parents and students? Because we had no idea the upper grade levels were having this. And to change the style of grading on them overnight it really isn't fair. Thank you. Kristen Atkinson, Amherst. Uh, just to piggyback on this, I have an 11th grader and an 8th grader. And we were talking about this tonight uh, before I came here. My 11th grader said to my 8th grader, wow, you have access to Empower. That's cool. I wish I did. Because um, she's going in the, the recruiting process right now. And a lot of coaches, um, especially at schools like Tufts, some of the more selective schools, want to see your transcripts. If you're focused on the end of the competency to have that for, most of the classes are year-long classes. And she needs to pr provide a transcript midway through her junior year or end of her sophomore year, or midway through her sophomore year, how is that going to reflect on her? And I guess it wouldn't be so much of a, um, a situation for her, but for her brother when he's in that similar situation. So as you're considering mid-semester grades, I would urge you to look at juniors and sophomores as well. 
Um, and then the honors challenge to reach that four, I'd really urge you to consider that because my daughter was urged not to take all honors or go for the honors challenge in her four core classes her freshman year. It was going to be too much for her. So I encourage you to talk to the freshman sophomore teachers about that. And then finally, <clears throat> how does competency-based grading align with AP courses that are prescribed outside of Sauhegan? Thank you. You're next. Hi, um, Andy Kowicki, Amherst. Um, uh, full, full disclosure here, I've got a sophomore and a freshman, so my anxiety and their anxiety level is not as much as is with some other individuals who have ki kids coming in. Um, we got the email about teaching parents about Empower, and um, I had my daughter log in and show me what was going on. I asked her questions. I said, okay, she's really good at math, probably close to a four, and I noticed a 2.5 in there. I said, honey, what's, what's this? And she proceeded to explain to me what the 2.5 was. Uh, it was in geometry. She's not as strong in geometry as she is in some of the other things. So, you know, she had a great expe ex ex explanation for me. My next thing was, okay, forget I'm your dad. I'm a college recruiter. And I asked you about this 2.5. And she had this blank look on her face. Like she had no idea how to explain because, you know, I'm her dad. I see her scores. I see her grades all the time. Talking to her uh, about a recruiter. And that's what we have here. We have two elephants in the room. One not so big, one a little bit bigger. Um, the first one is, and it's a question, she also has or takes a, a VLAX course in um, Mandarin. She was approved for that, and she's, she's got a 98% average in that. She brought up her VLAX um, website, and I'm seeing she's got 180-some-odd lessons, and she's completed 120 of them. She's got a 98%. 10 out of 10 here, 10 out of 10 here, 9 out of 10, 9 out of 10, 100%, 98%. Wow, totally understandable. My question to you as a board is, how are you going to handle VLAX in reference to this competency base? Because some of these teachers, and I'm, I'm only talking about Mandarin now, um, how are they going to go to the competency, competency based? Or are they going to keep going with the A, B, C, D, 98, 99 percent? Okay, that's that's the small elephant. Okay, um, the 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 bigger elephant is um, the GPA. And how are we going to? These kids are going to be here for four years. After four years, they're going to college. My daughter's already looking at schools. Um, in fact, coincidentally, and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to take up too much time, last week she played soccer for a global premier uh, soccer league in Bedford. Uh, she's on the elite team. They had a seminar for kids who were looking to go to college. They had a number of schools, and I'll just name them real quick, Colby Sawyer, Norwich, University of Vermont, uh, and Montpe UVM, New England College, Keene, UNH, St. Anselm's, SNHU, St. Joe's in Maine, and there was another one, Siena. And they had a, a uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I took snapshots if anybody wants to take a look at them. The very first thing on the top was what they're looking for is GPA. To their credit, they, they, said, they told the kids, don't make soccer your goal because it's not going to be achievable. You're going to do it on your grades, and uh, that was admirable. You know, they're looking for soccer players, but they're saying that soccer in your future is is probably very minuscule. Go go with your grades, but they were still looking at the GPA for acceptance into the school, and they spent over almost a half an hour on GPAs, not only in high school as to what they were looking for. 
but also in college. Once they get to college, how do they maintain a GPA? What if the GPA goes down? Will they still be able, eligible to play soccer? You know, things like this. Uh, this is the big elephant here. How do you, as a board, explain to these students, and again, my anxiety isn't that much because um, we're not going to have to deal with it. The class of 2024 moving forward will is when they go to um, a, a recruiter, they're not going to know what's going on. And I did ask the question at the seminar. I said, "What? You know, where's the um, one, two, three, four? And they're all looking at me like... Can I answer your question? Sure. We're going to have GPAs. What's that? We're going to have GPAs. Moving forward up, up to 2030? We're always have going to have two GPAs. All three of my, my kids are going to go through the recruiting process. I've talked to all the coaches in the schools as well. And they, they, they've told me that we want is GPAs and SAT or ACT scores. Okay. So we're going right. to have those. Uh, and the reason I ask this question is because I asked the same question to the seminar individuals, and they, they had no clue. Yeah. They were just looking at GPAs. So yeah. we're, we're going to have those. As far as VLAX is concerned, I don't know the answer to that question. That's Karen Shaninis. What happened? And, to and, and you know, Karen's in the back of the room. Yeah. Well, but the, the grade gets reported on the transcript. That's how it works. Yeah. Wait. What's that? I can't hear her. I think she's saying VLAX is competency based. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. <laughs> we'll have to invite you up. Does everybody know what VLAX is here? Okay. Hi, Sorry, Andy. <laughs> Hello. Well, VLAX is a virtual high school. It's a charter school in New Hampshire, for those of you who might not be familiar. And some of our students um, do take VLAX courses as part of an extended learning opportunity. So VLAX courses transfer to Sauhegan and to the transcript as any other high school. So if a student takes a course outside of um, Sauhegan High School and they've been approved to take that course, that course from that other institution will also be included on the transcript. And they receive an end of the, after they've completed the course, they receive a grade just like in any other high school. So I'm not sure what the did I get that? Yeah. Okay. Well, you got it. You got it. Is that, thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that. That answered it, right, Brian? Yeah, okay. absolutely. And, and I just want to let you know that my anxiety level will go up with the class of 2024 being the president of Sahigan PTSA. I'm going to have parents coming to me before they come to you. So the more I know, the better. Thank you. My name is Marilyn Gibson. I am an Amherst resident. Uh, we've been a resident of the community for over 26 years. I have 29 years in education, uh, private and public schools. First of all, um, I want to thank Christine and Adam for entertaining some of my questions and inviting me to the SAU to at least clarify a bunch of maybe misconceptions that I had. Uh, moving on, though, I hate this report card. I think that actually stinks. Um, and the reason why is it's missing a huge ingredient. And that ingredient, well, actually, it's missing two ingredients. One is there is no standard aligned with any of those. I mean, you have reading, you have math, but where is the geometry? Where is the informational text? Um, it doesn't have any of that on there, as far as I can see. And it's such a little print. Um, secondly, it doesn't have any narrative. A teacher should be able to give a narrative. And there is a lot of software out there that does provide narratives. Um, 
my teaching basically was in middle school, grades um, five, six, seven, and eight. So when I, in, when my district, the district I was in for over 16 years, went to competency-based grading, it was back in 2012. And we were one of the first communities to do that. And we struggled. We really did. It takes a long time to get this straight. So we struggled. But I must say that Empower has just about blown my head off, my shoulders. It is confusing. Um, we used Power School over in Raymond, middle school, and throughout the district. Um, it also was rolled in very effectively in that we told the parents that we were basically introducing this as a transition and that it would take several years to make it suitable, adequate, and meet everybody's expectations. So it's going to take a while. I understand all the fears of the high school parents. Um, my oldest granddaughter lives in the community and she's in, now in eighth grade. And I have seen her progress reports and it stinks. I hate it. It does not get to the point. It makes parents go crazy. Um, I've heard from teachers, I've heard from parents. I am also a church school superintendent at the Amherst Congregational Church. I hear from those parents and they are just going bananas. So Christine and I had chatted for a while one day and her videos, I'm hoping when she does deliver them to the community that they do express some, let's say, ease of getting into Empower and understanding it. But right now, in order for me to understand it, I had to flip flip-flop through several screens in order to know exactly what my granddaughter may have been graded on. And getting into Empower is not the easiest thing either. So obviously their efforts are great, but I think a little bit more background information and a little bit more um, research could have been done before implementing the competency base. I worked on competency base. I worked with a team of literature and language arts and social studies team in order to develop the competencies for our school system in Raymond. Um, if any parent wants to speak with me in regards to the multiple facets that are involved in competency-based grading, especially in the middle school area, I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. My granddaughter does not understand rubrics. And I find that the teachers do not take enough time in the middle school, and unfortunately in the high school, spe specifically ninth grade, do not take enough time to explain what the rubric actually means. One thing, if you're at a four, yes, you've excelled at the standard, but you have not moved beyond the standard. And that's what I think moving along and above the expectations should be. In Raymond, we actually had children, such as in Sohegan High School, taking high school courses, I'd say at the middle school, but they went to the high school to do that. And to me, that's moving over and above a three to a four. And a lot of students at the middle school do not achieve that expectation because they don't have it well defined in a rubric. So rubrics are extremely important. But I do commend the system getting into competency-based grading. It can be done and it can be useful, but it's in the way that it's done that's important. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Victoria? Hello, uh, Victoria Preci. I live here in Amherst. I, like Shannon, have a fourth and a fifth grader. So my kids are not here at Sohegan. 
Um, I'm also the PTA president. I come to a lot of Amherst school board meetings. I don't necessarily come to this meeting. I look around the room and there's a lot of faces that I don't know. Um, but I thought that we had a little bit of time before I needed to pay attention to these things. And then when word on the street was, hey, it's changing the transcript. I had this moment of thinking, well, my kids aren't applying for college for a really long time. Then I thought about the fact that I've sat in on Christine's um, presentations about one, two, three, fours for several years. And I understand them, but wait a minute, that was a few years ago. So if, I need, if I'm gonna be ready for when they get to high school, I need to start paying attention now. So part of me being here is, is for that reason. Everyone else has already said that they're having a hard time with Empower. Um, again, my kids are in elementary school and middle school, which I know isn't your jurisdiction, but it's really difficult at that level. Um, my, at some point in the presentation, the comment was made that eighth graders would be surveyed so that they really have input into what this transcript is gonna look like when they're in high school. Your kids are older than mine. My 11 year old is in fifth grade. In three years, she's not gonna know what a transcript needs to be in college. So I, as a parent and as a citizen here in Amherst, look to the elected school board and those who run our SAU to make those decisions. I applaud everyone. I love the idea of community council. I love all these things. But really when it comes down to it, I'm looking for the adults in charge to make some decisions and roll things out in a way that makes sense, not only for our students and our teachers, but also for our community. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, we'll just take one more question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tiani Coleman from Amherst, and I have a uh, Sauhegan 2017 graduate, and then I also have a 2021 student, a 2023 student, a 2027 student, and a 2030 student. Um, so just so that you do know that the two children I have who are currently in Sauhegan actually um, feel positive about it. They, um, they weren't positive when they first heard that that was going to happen, but now through the process of this year, um, have had good teachers that have helped explain it to them and everything, and they are, are bought in. They're sold in. Um, they were not happy when they heard that the transcript was going to convert, even though I felt like it was important. They weren't happy because they didn't think it would make, be a good conversion, and it, it was apples to oranges, so they were worried about that. But as a parent, you know, I have concerns that they don't have because I know what the college process is like and all of these things, and so I have concerns that they don't have. Um, a lot of them are concerns that have already been voiced tonight. I think I'd just like to say that my, my main concerns really are, of course, that we don't really, aren't able to distinguish between, um, I guess the standard of a three, for example, is just basically meeting a standard. And it's always been that I've wanted my children to excel and do very well and do better than just meeting a standard. And now it's very, very hard to tell how my kids are really actually doing. It's hard to know if they are really at the top of their class or if they're just in the middle of their class. And it's not, it's, it, it's just really hard to know and it's, it would be better if we could really know what that is. And I'm also concerned about what's already been mentioned that it's not clear to them how to excel um, in the past, they've had situations where exceeding expectations is completely vague. They have no idea how to do it. They try to do it, but it's not the way the teacher wanted them to do it, so they aren't able to do it. And I think they're doing better at that, but it's still really hard, and they feel like in so many instances there's no way to do that. And tonight was the first time I even heard that honors was a way to do that. I just thought honors meant they got an H. Um, so I think it needs to be much more clear how they actually exceed expectations, what they need to be able to do in order to do that. I worry that this, this system might be more subjective, um, where the teachers kind of get to decide where the kids are and they're not able to meet objective standards quite as well. And then finally, I just wanted to say that um, this was an example from last year, my child who was in eighth grade. He got a 2.5 on some assignment. He had been, he's mostly, you know, a, a plus kind of student, he had been in math at least, and um, but he got a 2.5 on something, and he said, and I said, oh well, you know, you're gonna, what are you gonna do about that? How are you gonna fix that? And he said, oh, it doesn't matter because I understand it. It was just something really stupid. I understand it, so it doesn't matter because we're doing competency-based education, so it doesn't matter because I understand it. 
And I said, fine. And then when the report cards came out at the end of the year, because he had that one 2.5, he wasn't able to be on the high honors. Now, this was eighth grade. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It was fine. But if that kind of thing were to happen to a high school student on their transcript when they're going forward, it, it could affect them. So I just wanted to bring those things up. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, do you want to make any other comments before we move on? It's closing. Sure. Yeah. Did you ever answer the questions that you were waiting to answer? Well, we, I think we went through. I mean, How are students differentiated? What's that? Well, that's why I'm saying, do you want to start? Or? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I mean, well, I think we have a whole, we have a whole crowd here, so I, mean, I think we should just take it one by one. Sure. The first one was, first the whole Sanborn as a comparator. Okay, so there's questions about Sanborn as a comparator, yep. which we have to look into. I want to just take that first. Well, I mean, we can look into Sanborn's performance as a comparator, but there are, are that was one that was brought up. Um, I'm, I'm sh there are several others that use competency-based grading throughout the United States, and that can be, their performance can be researched. But So, yeah, so I'll take the Sanborn one. Yeah. Um, so in terms of Sanborn, so I think part of the, the concern came from um, Stephanie voiced the, the Sanborn the loudest, the concern with Sanborn. So the reason I asked about Sanborn was because I think to remind everybody the importance of understanding this that the state is required there seems to be um, an idea that we're fitting a square peg into a round hole okay and that we're the only ones out there doing this we're not this is a state requirement to move to competency-based education competency-based grading and it has been that that's been something that's been out there for six years Okay, Sanborn, the reason I brought up Sanborn was because Sanborn was one of the very first high schools to convert to competency-based education or what we're calling mastery learning. And being the first one, I wanted to understand from Christine, hey, if they're the first ones out there, they must have learned what not to do. How do we approach Sanborn? And I know that Christine has been working, like we've been working with Sanborn really closely. We have um, the PACE assessments at Sauhegan. So we, we had already been working with Sanborn closely on PACE. All right. Now, in terms of Sanborn and the SAT scores, some of you may not agree with this, but achievement scores are a really bad way to compare high schools. It's really bad. Why is that? Well, because you, when you're a, a public school, you cannot control for your inputs. So let's take a factory, an automobile factory, for example, okay? If you're producing automobiles, you can source your suppliers and say, I want this quality of steel or I want this quality of aluminum. If you're Bishop Girton, you can say, I want this quality of student. You make them go through an entrance exam. Okay? You're self-selecting the very best students into those schools. In a public school, you can't do that. In a public school, you have to take what you get. So the best way to compare high schools, like high schools, is not SAT scores because the, diff the inputs running through that school every year are variable. Sometimes they can be highly variable. So that's why one of the things that we're saying is we're looking more toward a growth model because the, the best thing you can do as a public school is to look for the inputs that come in and say, how much did I grow this child from where they're starting from? Okay, And Sanborn has been moving down that path. Is Sanborn the same type of quality school that Sohegan is? I don't want to say anything negative about Sanborn. You know, they, they do their best. They're a different town. Um, but they're, they're not a benchmark school of ours in terms of achievement scores. We're looking to Hollis. We're looking to Bedford. We're looking to Oyster River, Hanover, Wyndham. Okay? But um, the reason we brought up Sanborn was for a different reason. It's because they've already kind of tilled this, this ground on competency based. So I think it was just important to make that type of clarification in terms of why we looked at Sanborn. It wasn't that we want to become Sanborn. In fact, they, it was more because they've, 
they've gone down that route, this road, so we want to try, try to figure out what we, what we can learn from them. Um, another question was um, going back to grading progression. I think, Courtney, you had brought that up. Um, I think, you know, I don't know how to answer, I don't know how we'd answer that, but go ahead. Uh, um, how Empower calculates? Was it the? Well, there, there are multiple people who touched upon that in different ways, yeah. so I think we need to, it, what, what very clearly came out from the, the group today, and you guys tell me if I just, you know, disagree if I don't have this down, but there seems to be, and I've heard this from other parents in town too, Empower seems to be a major source of frustration. Matter of fact, I get a question from parents all the time is, is it competency-based grading or is it mastery learning or is it just that Empower stinks? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that a big component seems to be that Empower, <laughs> I don't want to say Empower stinks, but Empower is not doing its job. So the question, I guess the question I have is, is, you know, how do we know, Christine and Adam, whoever wants to answer, how do we know that the grading um, that's taking place at the high school is accurate, um, is not subjective, and how do we, how can we ensure that um, Empower is capturing that in a way that people can understand it? Um, so, first of all, as far as the accuracy, our teachers are in Empower all the time and they're checking students' standard scores. I'll get emails sometimes and say, hey, the system didn't update this score yet, when is that going to happen, and can you double check, or can you help me with this piece? So Empower is um, it, it, something that, you know, you're constantly putting grades and scores in, and then it's rerunning calculations for students, and teachers are always checking those calculations. Um, as far as it being, you know, accurate, um, because the teachers are checking all the time and they've been so diligent and so careful, you know, if there is an error that has occurred, we fix it right away. Um, because, every, you know, we're humans, you might put the wrong score in, and the, the, the part of that is students being able to get in, um, as well as parents being able to access the system. So I think one of the challenges um, is that right now, um, students uh, only through ninth grade are able to access the system, and we're working on a plan to, you know, roll up that access for students. Um, so I think that will be really helpful. We're also, um, and it's either going out tomorrow or Wednesday, information to parents on how to access the parent portal. We were intentionally timing it with quarter two progress reports um, because the more information in the system, the easier it is to navigate and understand. And I can certainly put together some sort of guidance document on our standards, our competencies, and then also how Empower calculates. And I think those are some of those missing pieces. Um, where we also have, and this is something I hadn't thought of sharing with students, but I think we could. We have assessment maps that show, um, you know, where uh, how many assessments we give in every course. Um, we can update those so those reflect the maximum achievable score so a student can see, well, here's the standard. It's on these three assessments. So if I didn't do well on this assessment, these are the other two I need to be looking at. Never thought to share those with students. Those are internal documents, but we can look at, you know, coming up with a um, set that might make sense for students, especially at the high school level. So we have a lot of that internally. Um, we can certainly make that more visible and make our system more understandable. Uh, my follow-up is the max score based on the nebulous way that Empower calculates grades for the standards for the competencies and then for the course score. Um, you have a different max score for every every class, not every assessment, not class. Or you mean every academic score of every class? You have a mm -hmm. different because it's so nebulous the way it calculates and sometimes there are two out of two that can't even make a four and then it's using that as part of its calculation even down the road. Do you have a way of calculating the max score for each academic score and indicating that on your transcript? Because if I'm communicating, okay, yes, my daughter made a three and a half in this class, where is there to indicate that's all she could have earned? Mm -hmm. Currently that isn't part of our um, progress reports or transcripts, but it's certainly something I don't know that would, that would make sense on a transcript. I think it would be more important that students are always given the opportunity to earn the four, um, so that that, because uh, I think that could be really confusing to colleges. Um, but midway through the year, um, we've always let our, our teachers know that they have to indicate, and we have a drop down comment available for them, whether or not a student is on track. Um, and if they're on track, 
then that means that they're meeting expectations for that teacher. So whatever their score is, that's probably pretty close to being one of the highest um, that they could have achieved. The other piece, too, is that um, this system, because we're looking at scoring students on standards which feed into competencies, um, if you're really trying to get more information, the best way is to go online. The, the paper document, you know, as Marilyn mentioned, it's not giving as much information. So going into that system, I think, is one of the better ways to be able to drill down to really see and to understand what those maximum achievable scores are. Okay. I'm going to... Did you say we'll have Empower next week? On tomorrow or Wednesday? Um, so, Courtney, this is not a public... I apologize. I really do, but it's not a public hearing. So we have to follow the formality. If you, if you want to make a comment, you have to come to the podium during public comment. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize, but that's supposed to be how it works. Um, I'll, I'll create, I'll give another opportunity we can come up. She didn't quite answer my question. Oh. Um, so what is the question that you had then? Well, you have classes currently that you cannot earn a four in. Some classes have already closed. The semester is over and they could not earn a four. How is that indicated now that you've made this part of my child's permanent transcript? How, how is that indicated that they were never given the opportunity to make a four? Because it's, I realize that your goal is that all the classes are made of four, but we're still in transition and this hasn't worked its way out yet. And so you're making a permanent record and I want to know how that's indicated. So I'm, I don't want to put Bill on the spot, so if you're comfortable. We can't hear back here. Okay. Yeah, the, the people in the back having trouble. I'll, I'll, I'll talk um, and I'll talk into the mic and Bill, it, I think Adam's looking for your response, but the question, I think the, what the question boils down to is that uh, Laura had said that your daughter, right, had taken a class and the maximum score was a three and a half it was like that she three, felt she could get. 3.3 or something. Or 3.3. .3. So I think everybody in the audience would think that it would be logical that every class the max score would be a four, right? So if like in every class a max score would typically be an A plus, you would logically think that every class a max score would be a four, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So I guess the question is, is that true? How are we addressing that? Etc. Again, from my short time with the experience here in, in uh, at Sauhegan, that has to do with the way the curriculum is being developed uh, in each of the courses. So opportunities for students to achieve um, that extension, that four. I think the biggest thing that's confusing to people is that we keep going back to four means A or four means A plus and that's not the case we it's very this is very difficult it's a very difficult concept but we have to separate that when you when you if you if you think about meeting the standard um, as we as we have been saying those multiple experience at meeting the standard looks like we assign a symbol the symbol is three that's meeting the standard now we want students to go beyond that and we want to create experiences in our courses that allow students to be independent and take those experiences and the learning that they've had at the standard level and take it beyond. So there should be opportunities for four, but not every opportunity in a course is going to allow you to go to a four. Shouldn't every course allow you to get to a four? Oh, I'm sorry. I think that one's working. <laughs> Um, so I understand not every assessment allows you to go to a four, but Christine, shouldn't every course allow you to get to a four? So I think one of the challenges not not an A necessarily. Right. I mean, because so I get that that, but you should be able to get to a four, right? So in our, uh, I, I think one of the challenges is that when it's only a semester long course, it's a very short period of time. Okay. Um, so we probably have to look specifically into Laura's. Um, question that she has yeah, is really hard. I would think a semester, you should be able to get to a four. Like, yeah, I would agree. So we will okay. look into that and report back on that specific <laughs> question. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Bill. Um, all right, another issue. Um, a few more of these. Another issue that came up, and I think Martin actually Brink brought it up was, and it gets this gets back to the issue of four is the un, one of the underlying. Questions. Is Martin still here, by the way? Because I don't want to speak for him. But no. So one of the one of the underlying issues is, you know, every parent thinks about their kid differentiating differentiating themselves from other kids. That was essentially the nature of his question. So, how does this system allow 
our students to differentiate themselves from each other if we're quote unquote just meeting a standard. And I'll, I'll, I'll base the caveat on that. When I was first exposed to this concept, my understanding was that a three was mastery. That a three was like, I, I just use this analogy because it helps me understand it, that a three was like earning a black belt. That a one was like a white belt. You know, a two was like a green belt if, for people who have gone through that. that um, and a three was a black belt. And then if you wanted to get a four, what that really meant was that you were moving beyond quote unquote grade level, which was, which was the, the key to allowing our kids to not be stuck in a grade simply because of their birth date, right? It allowed them to open up that gate for them to be able to move on. So how do we, that made sense to me, but, I, but this question also makes sense because then how do you differentiate yourself from other, other kids? And, and so that's, I think that goes to the point that I was trying to make. It has to do with the curriculum that exists in a course. As, so as we're working on building our curricula in this standards-based uh, experience that kids have, our teachers are looking for ways to build opportunities in the course to extend that level of mastery. So that might look like asking four students to go off take that learning and develop a group project independently and bring that back and present to the class. That could be an extension. And so those things are being built and need to continue to be built in all curricula that we have. So there are opportunities for students to, to extend that now, but our teachers will continue to work on building those kinds of opportunities so that there are more chances for students to experience that extension. Okay. Something about uh, Amy. Yeah. So, I guess um, that question led me to think about that this is actually the opposite of comparing yourself to other students. Mm -hmm. You're actually being assessed based on the standards, not the Correct. old school bell curve of you know yes. when you were in college or mm -hmm. some high schools. So it's really about have you met or exceeded the standard, not have you done better than your fellow student. It's about personalizing the experience for, for, yeah. for children. That actually leads into, uh, there's just a couple more, because a, a lot of the questions, to be honest with you, were kind of mixed into this. They, they all came at the same, the same stuff. Um, this one was distinct, though, um, in that the question is, how are we applying the mastery system to advanced placement courses, which are standard across the country? So is there a thought process around like how is that going to work? Um, and I can let Kathy jump in too, or Bill. Um, I know Kathy's been working with some of our AP teachers. Um, we're going to develop a set of AP standards and look at scoring against those standards. Um, Kathy, I don't know if you want to. Well, I would just wait. say that um, AP oh, yeah. has um, recently been redesigning um, all of their courses and have created standards and essentially competencies within their those courses. So those would be the ones that we would implement because you, you really need to follow the AP curriculum because it is a standardized curriculum. So that's, and pretty much gets a little complicated. Every AP course at one time did a little bit differently, but they've been scoring on a scale, um, one to four, some a little bit different, but so this is really bringing a little bit more consistency to that as well. So I, uh, um, some of our teachers um, have made that transition in terms of the design and others are working on it because a certain, um, especially math, got out right ahead just as we were doing this transition, the math courses um, from the AP transitioned over and now some of the, the AP Lit and Comp courses, they've designed their target browsers, well, their competencies and standards. So we still have some work to do around the world language. And um, science has also done, they're pretty much done their work, so. And there is a weighted GPA for AP and dual enrollment courses, so that's what compensates for that almost, you know, above standard level. So that piece was built into our system. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, just a couple more. A couple more, and then we need to move. Um, I know we have a student here to present on school start times, so I'm sorry about that. Um, didn't anticipate it being this long, so I apologize. Um, 
So let me see. Um, what's the best one to come up now? Oh, that, yeah, let me do this one and this one. All right. So the next question, there has been some, there were some questions, I've gotten questions outside of the meeting as well around power school, that other schools use power school. So I'm not trying to fit, you know, I'm not saying let's go out and buy power school. I'm just saying well, we, are. we actually are. Are we going to do that? Well, for our student information no, system. To okay. So uh, right now we use something called MMS, uh, which runs our student information system, and then Empower is our gradebook. We are switching MMS to power school over the next six months. Um, that will be put in place. And then, as I mentioned before, we're looking at Empower and figuring out, is that still the way we need to go, or do we need to switch to something else that more tightly aligns to power school? We're going to figure that out. It's too soon to make that decision. Um, but that power school is coming. Okay. All right. And the last one, the last one I think was really a distinct question was Andy had brought it up. If Andy's still here, there you are. Um, is that so if you're an athlete and you're being recruited in your junior year, which is common, um, and your coach says, you know, can we see your transcript? Usually that happens more in the senior year, actually. But can we see your transcript to see, you know, where, what you're, where, you're, where you're doing? And that student has, you know, a lot of 2.5s or whatever just because that's where they are in the trajectory. Um, have we thought about ways to um, address that? Um. And I would also want to rely on Karen a little bit. I don't know, Karen, if we ever produce a mid-year transcript for juniors or it would, if it would be a transcript through sophomore year and then report cards from there. Um, Karen really oversees that transcript piece. but um, So that is a little bit of a distinction. The other piece, too, and we've talked about this for um, our uh, seniors, really looking, I had mentioned that idea of the assessment map, really looking at making sure that we're designing our courses in a way that if we do need to produce um, certain checkpoint scores that we've given students opportunities so that we match the pacing of the course with that learning really well um, so that we aren't harming students and we're putting their best foot forward um, in that. So that's something right now because we're able uh, teachers are able to look at Empower and then translate. They're putting that grade in MMS. They're really making that conversion already if they haven't had the opportunity to you know, reach a three or a four. They're able to translate right now. Um, once Empower fully rolls up um, and we're really translating, you know, we're not translating, we have our, our um, course scores. That and we're not looking, um, you know, at the the A's and B's and C's and so forth as we roll our system up. That's going to be an important piece that we really look at our curriculum and our piecing and make sure we match it to the learning and to our certain checkpoints. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. Just because that's mm -hmm. really important for seniors yes. who are who we do uh, currently provide the progress report mm -hmm. as grades yeah. as well as the end of the semester as grades. Yeah. So. I'll just make one more comment, then we have to move to the next topic. Um, but this slide here, Christine, and for the other people on the leadership team, um, it would be really helpful if during the course of the year when we had to report out, we could at least tell colleges that they are on, they are like, they are on the trajectory toward achieving a whatever. Yeah. Given the fact that our new grading system is a trajectory grading system, right? So, you know, something like this where they're, they're in the band of achieving a whatever, um, I think would be helpful, which is why I brought this slide up. Yeah. Which I think was your intention, right, Adam? Okay. We still have to figure out how that works into the GPA, though. Yes. Um, I think I've got most of the questions here. Anything else from the board that you thought that I missed? Well, there's the whole semester one grades for 2023 on the transcript. And we passed a motion to do that, and then Adam. Laura? The, uh, having the um, transcript for 2023 have semester one grades. I, mean, I understand the GPA would be used for the end of the year or whenever the course ends. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, so the, the board's motion was uh, Ms. Taylor motion that so Hegan should provide semester grades, A, Bs, and Cs, and mid-semester grades, including A, Bs, and Cs for the class of 2023, uh, which we are doing. Um, we are not putting those on the transcript. Those would be inaccurate to put on the transcript because they are a point in time reference leading towards an end of the year uh, final grade. And so that's uh, a, a fundamental uh, unfairness for those students to put that on the transcript. George, uh, real quick, how much have we invested in, in power? <laughs> Not in terms of human capital, but actually financial. Yeah, uh, um, a, a, a decent amount. I, I actually have it. Someone asked me that before, and we've we've looked into it a little bit. Um, it's it's not it's not seven figures. It may not even be six, but it's it's yeah, it's not even six figures. But yeah. Um, so since George cracked the the egg on the empower. Um, and we got back to that. So <laughs> there's, uh, Christine, you mentioned that the competency-based education has been in New Hampshire for about six years, -ish, mm -hmm. right? Yes, -ish, yeah. So, and we're not the first school to um, deploy it, and therefore there's other schools that have done it, and other schools have also used Empower-like mm -hmm. program systems. Mm -hmm. So what other systems have some of those benchmark schools mm -hmm. looked at? And you know, if you don't know off the top of your head, that's okay. But what I'd like to, I guess, ascertain is some comparative data on where they are in their implementation utilizing some other mm -hmm. system other than Empower. You know, it, it's kind of like you know comparing you know, anybody who's ever worked in a production facility or, or a company is used ERP <coughs> systems and you have thousands, it seems like, of different ERP systems, right, which is essentially what this is. Um, and comparing, you know, a homegrown one or a new kid on the block um, system with an SAP or an Oracle or something like that. Uh -huh. um, I'm not saying that SAP and Oracle are easy to implement, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, I've yet to run across an ERP system that is. However, some are easier than others, and they do are more in tune with the facility and what that facility requires than other systems. So, again, I don't need an answer right now, but it would be good to get some comparative data mm -hmm. uh, at our next meeting. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ben. Anybody else? All right. Um, just in closing, before we move on to the next subject, it is important for the public to understand that this board in the past has asked the administration that as we transition to this new model, this mastery learning model, that we operate under certain conditions. One is do no harm, and the other one is whatever we develop, we, we are um, whatever we put out there should not just be a, a good replacement, but it should give our students a competitive advantage. So the whole point of switching this is not to just um, and be careful what I say here, but this isn't a playground for educators, right, of testing like the latest model. The whole point is to, is to give our school system a competitive advantage and give each individual child a competitive advantage so that we move to a place where there's a personalized learning pathway for every child. That's the goal. Um, Clearly, the implementation at the high school hasn't worked the way we wanted it to this year, but we all know that. I mean, we're, we're definitely aware of that. Um, some of us have a vested interest in it, not that as a board member you ever make decisions as a board for your own kids, but there are some of us up here, like Laura, like Pim, like myself, may I have an eighth grader and 11th grader, and, and the, the superintendent here as well, who have, who have kids in the schools. So we're, we're plugged into what's going on through them. I feel like I'm particularly plugged in because I have the eighth grader in the class of 2024, and I have the junior. So I'm getting it from I'm getting the perspective from both angles. So uh, we have that commitment to everybody here. We never thought this implementation was going to be smooth. Um, we would have liked it to be smoother than it is, but we'll get there. We will. We appreciate it for everybody for showing up because the insight is is valuable. Okay. Um, and hopefully we gave everybody enough time. Typically go board meetings, you're supposed to come up, you're supposed to make a comment, we don't respond, but that's just 
you know, that's just not appropriate given the, the number of people here. So hopefully everybody had the ability to make a comment, and we help, we'll have more of these. Um, I talked to Adam this afternoon about trying to get parent forums as early as February uh, versus March. Um, so we're working on that. Given the deliberative and everything else, it's a little bit of a tight fit, but we're, we're working to see if that's possible. Okay? So thank you. Um, what I'd like to propose now is, given the fact that dual enrollment and the advanced placement discussion was kind of a fun discussion, <laughs> supposed to be, um, and we do have a student here, I'd like to move the student and start and end time discussion up to the next agenda item. So if we could do that. Is that you, Delaney? Yes. All right. Oops. Is, that, is that okay with the board that we do that? Yeah. Steve? Yeah. You good with that? All right. What's your definition of by the way? No. Torture. Set up my devices just for uh you should just start. You okay? You need help? Call you, Delaney. Okay. Can you hear me? Louder. Um, why don't you take this? Um... Does it work now? Yeah, but you gotta. Yeah, just okay. Talk okay. You gotta go. Um, Better rip. So, <laughs> we, as community council, thought that the best option to um, get the students' input and their feedback on the later start time and their opinions on that would be through a survey so we worked with Adam to create a survey and then at our most recent forums last Tuesday we gave the survey to um, we gave a link to all the students and so we had 498 total responses 140 of them were from freshmen 142 from sophomores 67 from juniors because um, we had a little bit of trouble receiving the responses just by the way we orchestrated the forum and that was the first try so we fixed it for the rest of them and then 119 for the seniors and 24 for the faculty um, at, also at the forum we explained that the estimated start time would be at 845 because research says that after 830 is the ideal start time and when Adam came to speak at Community Council he I believe he said that was It'd be as late as yeah as late as 845 and the end time would be 345 if that occurred so our first was um, after school time commitments so about 70 percent of our student body plays a sport 75 um, percent have a daily commitment after school whether that be a job a sport um, a non-affiliated school like a not 
a s activity that's not affiliated with the school. Um, and then about 50% are involved in a club at the school. Yes, sorry. Uh, can you turn up her mic? Is it possible to turn up Delaney's mic in the room? Oh, sorry. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're good. And then our next question was, how often are you late to school? So 263 responded that they're never late, 182 for occasionally, 38 for almost every day, and 13 for every day. And then our next questions were regarding like exhaustion levels in school. So we thought that this would help to show whether students are needing more sleep on a regular basis or what they currently have is okay. So as you can see, 300 never fall asleep in class, but then there are about 200 that um, have fallen asleep in class at one point or another, and six say that they fall asleep every day. Um, How many teachers? <laughs> I didn't look into that. Um, and then also for just tired on a regular basis, 86 were extremely, 149 for very, 211 for somewhat, and then about 50 for not at all. So with our transportation questions, we found that the majority of students either drive themselves to school or a parent drives them in. And then with the question comparing the change to the what currently happened, how they currently get to school, um, there were only 57 parents driving them to school after the start change, after the change in start time, compared to the current 110 responses. So I assumed that that would mean that the bus levels would increase, but according to this data, there were only 11 people that said that they would take the bus if this change occurred, and then there was an increase from students driving themselves from 203 students to 245. So there would be more students driving themselves to school. And then we asked the students on a six-point scale, as recommended by Adam, to avoid having an undecided question. That way, it would be more clear on who's in favor versus against. So if you're looking at in favor, it would be about 30% of the students were in favor of this change, and 70% were against the change, whether that be slightly in, uh, for it or extremely for it. And then we thought that the best way to really get students' input and opinions would be through an open response question, um, asking them how they specifically feel about this proposal. So here are a couple quotes. And these are just a couple of small samples and like different pit bits of information of what people wrote. A lot of them wrote like very lengthy paragraphs. So these are just small parts. And then if the board members want more of the responses, Adam has access to that data on an Excel sheet. So these are quotes from students that are in favor of the change. And then these are four different quotes from students that are not in favor. And then there was also a faculty response included. OK. And then lastly, I just um, thought it'd be a good idea to generalize different themes that I, res I interpreted from the open responses. Um, so many students felt that this would be beneficial because of the science with circadian rhythms, um, that teens naturally go to bed later, so it's better for them to wake up later as well. And then also those who naturally, or regardless, go to bed later, they then have the opportunity to sleep in when they don't currently. And then a few students have to get, or their parents leave before their younger siblings go to school. So if this change were to flop, then they could get their younger sibling ready for school as their parents leave for work. And then it also gives the students the option to wake up earlier and give themselves more time for breakfast to then give them more energy for the day. 
And then for responses that were opposed, there was a large majority for regarding sports and extracurricular activities. A lot of students who um, have sports that are not affiliated with the school stated that they wouldn't be able to do those because of the times that they begin and they're not allowed to late to practice or whatever. And then crew would also be very hard to have happen because they legally can't practice in the dark on the water. So if the, yeah. Um, and then um, jobs would be harder as well because they'd be competing with other local schools that end earlier. That's it. That's it? Yeah. Thanks, Delaney. All right. Questions from the board? I have one. Go ahead, George. Um, I found the percentage in favor of this relatively low, considering, you know, hey, I get to sleep in an extra hour or so. So do you have, and I guess your explanations kind of made sense if you have commitments it's kind of difficult outside of the school to kind of work around those schedules. But do you have like a census or an idea of like of the respondents who were in favor? Were they generally uh, younger students, older students? Do you know what the makeup of that was? Or was it kind of spread across the, the population? I believe it was spread across the population, but I can look into it further and then. I'd just be interested to know. Yeah. I would figure if there were older students, junior seniors, probably the commitment levels probably higher than it was if there were a freshman or a mm -hmm. Nice job. Thank you. Thanks, George. Sure. Uh, David. The lady, did you, uh, this is just done at the high school level? Yes. Or was done it in the middle school at all? No, it was just high school. You know, a parent data from the middle school? Are parents in the back Is there any parent data? So, uh, we did a survey about this topic um, over two years ago. Uh, we got several uh, hundred responses from parents, students, et cetera. So the, the parent data was um, nothing is, um, there's cl clearly no one agrees on everything, but there was uh, a, a, a pretty significant majority in favor of the change. Well, you know, um, so um, from my perspective, a large, a large portion of the problem that uh, could be solved or a, actually made worse is at the high school. It's really more of a high school question because of the extracurricular activities and because of sports and because of you know the length of the day and all this kind of thing. So um, I think it's very important to have the high school data number one, but we need to know the effect downstream, you know, downstream meaning the lower grades. And I guess the other part of it is is that you know, the, the very solutions that have been offered, you know, one of the things that, you know, years ago we did in the school system, in the high school system, is we changed from 180 days, which was the state requirement, down to 175. And then we added a period which lengthened the day. And uh, I'm not saying that you did anything, you had anything to do with this because <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't around, believe me. Um, but it changed the, it changed a lot of things about the day. It, it it helped a lot of the high end students get more classes in and take more AP classes and whatever. But it, but it tended to lengthen the day, which made the day start earlier. I think it's about a, it was about a twenty or twenty five minutes earlier start. Amy, you know this stuff better than I do. Twenty minute twenty minute earlier start. Well, twenty minutes added to the added to the length of the day. Um, but if you went back to the seven period day, that, that might have some positive effects on this. You know, it, it has some negative effects in some ways, like the high end kids would have less opportunities to take extra classes. Um, but most kids are, you know, in the four and five class range. They don't, they're not looking to take, you know, six and seven classes like some kids that I knew, you know. Um, but that's not, so I, you know, there are other ways of accomplishing what we need to do, but it would it would take going back some steps and you know and, and where we've been before. And I'm not sure that I have been on the committee. Adam that knows where, the, where what steps they tread, and uh, you know what considerations they made. But I don't know if that would help at all. Is to look back at where we were before and see how that might work.
Anyone else? Yeah, so I'm assuming all of this data is being fed to the committee, mm -hmm. right, Adam? Because I know we've had um, information via email from members of the public. Um, there's now this information from community council. Are there representatives from community council on the committee? Uh, not currently. The committee right now is administrative in nature okay. until we figure out. Um, we're, we're handling it internally right now, but we will include community council for sure. Okay. Yep. All right, any other questions from the board? All right, I do want to take this time to just open it up for public comment for just about five or ten minutes. Does anybody want to come up and provide comment, commentary? You could just come right to the podium. Go ahead, Jeannie. I mean, if you, you could just get, go. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jeannie Lute from Amherst. Um, I have been on many late start committees. <laughs> Um, we got really close years ago. Unfortunately, one of our boards um, did chose not to support it. But um, the same the same objections always occur. The same difficulty in you know dealing with sports at the end of the day and siblings. And um, I just wonder if um, be, because it seems like we're we're so tied to other schools in who we compete with. Um, having the same schedule, the same, so that when we are, you know, getting together for sports, we're all on the same schedule. I just wondered if, if we knew if there were any neighboring schools um, that we compete with for sports that had um, gone to a later start time um, so that we could all start to coordinate a little better. The three that I know of that have already implemented or, in, or have committed to are Oyster River, Portsmouth, and Keene um, have committed to doing that. Um, one of our neighboring school districts, I'll keep anonymous, said, we'll let you figure it out first and then we want to do it. Um, and a student from another neighboring school district, a student, uh, emailed me and asked for information because they're investigating it on behalf of their student body in that particular school district. Um, at regional and statewide superintendent meetings, this is a uh, more and more consistent topic and it's starting to intersect with things like the NHIAA which oversees um, ath athletic contests in the state about how that might need to change to, re to support uh, a school start time change. So my, my read of the landscape is that there is a push for this um, and everyone is waiting for other people to take the first steps so that they're not out too far out in front. Um, but there are there is significant conversation about it. Right, because I remember the the places that were successful in the in the country um, were places where the entire state or the entire city or whatever uh, chose to go in this route. Um, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I first off, I just want to say I'm one of the parents who took the survey two years ago. Oh, name and name and town, please. I'm sorry. Tiani Coleman Amherst. Thanks, Tiani. Um, and at the time that I took that survey, it was completely vague. You know, it was just kind of like, we're just kind of testing the waters a little bit. How do you feel about this? And I didn't, I, I don't remember all the questions exactly. I just remember that I kind of answered like, well, not this year, maybe next year we can, but I thought it was more like I was saying, maybe next year we can consider this a little bit. But also I didn't think that it was set in stone exactly how the hours would work and everything. And when I started, finding out more later after the fact that it was actually going to happen and it was probably going to happen next year and, and this was going to be the hours and the younger kids were going to now get out you know a lot later than the older kids and I was just like completely I was like I do not support this at all so I'm not sure that we can really say this survey two years ago says the parents support it because I think that if you were to do the survey again I think you might see that there are a lot more parents who don't support it that's my opinion I could be wrong sure. um, the things that I'm mostly concerned about are um, it's not just that the kids can't do sports as easily it's the it's right now you have a great program where they can do clubs at 2:30 and then do sports at 3:30, and sports tend to be every day clubs tend to be different days and they don't have so many conflicts that can work things out and if I'm, I'm worried that if this changes they will have those a lot of conflicts, they won't be able to be as involved in things. A lot of things will, will suffer. I have kids who are in band, and so to drop another class 
would be devastating because it's already very hard for them to get in um, electives and AP classes when they're taking band every year. And so then they would have to probably quit band, most likely, because they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, uh, it's also the idea that if they do do sports, they'd have to leave a lot earlier, so they'd miss a lot more school by having to leave. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you have younger kids, they, they mentioned bef on here that the younger kids, the older kids could put them on the bus, but I think there might be more of a concern the younger kids coming home, having the older kids be able to sometimes help them after school, whereas now the younger kids coming home, there's no one there to be able to help them after school. So. Those are my concerns. Thank you. Respond to one of those. So I will not support any plan that takes away that club time um, okay. from South Hegan High School. It has to maintain. That's a critical part of our success here. Hi, I'm Tara Pompeo, Amherst, and I'm really lucky because I get to work here. Um, one of the things that I was going to say was that time that's after school, which I don't really know what we call it now, it's is so invaluable. Times. What do you call it? It's changed a couple times. I don't know what we call it now either. Club um, time is I love I it for the clubs, but I also love it for um, kids who have kind of been struggling in a class, like say a math class. They get one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher after school many days a week. And I have watched kids who have had a hard time in math class particularly come after school and like after a couple of days or weeks of doing that like get it and that time is invaluable I'm, so I'm glad to hear you that, say that you wouldn't take that away I know you guys have been working on this for a long time I'm a hundred percent against this um, but I want you to know that I but the kids who I talk to at school are also pretty much against it. the kids who are most against it are the kids who work so please don't like kind of blow them off and you know there's a lot of them and they are frantically opposed to this because they will not be able to keep their jobs they will not be able to um, earn money to either go to college or have a car and have car insurance like like they're not just kind of little jobs like a lot of kids their jobs are kind of their thing my son actually wrote his um, college essay on his job and that's what kind of opened up the colleges for him like it's kind of a big deal so please remember how important that is um, also it's really important to me um, to have like just life like time for just life like I go to yoga classes or whatever I take a walk like kids hang out with their friends like please also don't take that time away because to get out an hour and a half later and then go to club time and then do sports or whatever like there's no time left in the day to just kind of hang out with your friends when I look back on my high school time I remember great teachers and great classes, but I remember a lot of time just hanging out with my friends. So please, like, don't let that go. And that's all. Thank you. Great Thank job. you. Matt? I'll try to be quick. Uh, Matt Layton, uh, Amherst. I have uh, two children in uh, high school at the moment. Um, I'm not really for it. I'm not really against it. What I came up here for was you had a couple of questions or a couple of uh, quotes that some of the kids put in there. Um, so one of the things I think this really addresses, and you, you've touched upon it, is sleep. Like, how much, are, how much are our kids as a community, how much do our kids sleep? Um, I've, my kids started out as infants, and I know what their sleep patterns were then, and I know what their sleep patterns are now. Um, as a professional, uh, what I do for a living, um, I've learned a great deal about sleep. and. Sleep isn't just sleep. I mean, I didn't just sleep eight hours last night. You know, I had an hour and 50 minutes of something called REM sleep. I had six hours of non-REM sleep. You know, I was awake 34 minutes, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, it's the REM sleep that is really, really important that these people get. It's less important for adults. It's much, much more important for the developing brains and you get most of your REM sleep in the last two hours of your eight hour sleep. Most of us on average need anywhere between seven to nine hours of sleep. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of research documents that kind of show the efficacy to things like this. Um, and even for adults, even though we don't, we don't physically, our brains don't physically need as much REM sleep as somebody that's, let's say, of, of the high school age. So again, I'm not really for it. I'm not really against it. I don't know how this all mishmashes with our clubs. 
I can say that ice hockey should change their ice time so my kid doesn't have to leave school just to go to practice, <laughs> which I think is a little ridiculous because um, he misses the same class every time he has to leave. And, he, you know, it's, it's just absurd. Um, but anyway, and, I, and I've had kids that have really benefited from having the 30 to 40 minutes before they have to go to practice to go meet with a physics teacher, meet with a chemistry teacher, meet with a bio, you know, so I don't know where I am, but, you know, it's, it's really about how much sleep these kids get. So, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Shannon. Hi, Shannon Gascoigne, Amherst. Um, I really appreciate the last gentleman's comments um, because for me that's really what it's about too. There are lots of reasons why this may or may not work for any of my four children and their own individual needs. Um, but I think what I would expect and ask you all as a governing body is to consider you know, the science, the data, the research, everything that is out there. Obviously listen to what everyone's saying. <coughs> this is a great survey. Like. Thank you for doing this. It's really enlightening to hear what students have to say. I would venture to guess that on any given year, this will look a little different. Um, I'm not sure what was discussed in terms of how some of those um, hurdles may be overcome. I think Mr. Chen mentioned some possible solutions. It sounds like we started later in the past, and I'm sure kids still played sports and, and we did things. So um, just as a matter of public policy, um, you know, we we kind of know from the CDC, the American Pediatrics Association, that it's what's best for their health and well-being. Maybe not their schedules, but thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Good. Feel free to just get in line if you have comments. Hi, Sue Broadley Amherst. I just wondered if it had been considered um, later start times means that kids are on the field later at night. If the lights had been a factor for the community, you know, we, we live near campus, um, had they considered security measures and transportation for the buses later in the evening? I just wondered if that's been addressed, if you could address that. All of those things will need to be addressed, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, lighting as it, as it affects the neighbors, is that, was that your concern? Well, right, yeah, I mean, who's maintaining that? Who's turning sure. it off? Yep. You know, it's disturbing the community around to have the cans on that late at night, noise at night, cars leaving. Uh, we already face security issues or transportation on Simeon Wilson issues with the overflow field and people backing up, parking on the road. That's a major, major issue. Um, and I wondered if security is something that's considered with later start times, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all I wanted to know. Um. I, I want a point of clarification, by the way, regarding school start times, nothing's happening next year, just in case people knew. Okay, just want to make sure. That nothing is imminent for a school start times. This is uh, going to be an iterative process that lasts for more than a year. So, My name is Claire Bison. I'm from Amherst. Um, my comment might seem silly, but all of my kids have their opposition is the lack of sunlight at the end of the day. And I'm curious if there's research on that and if that's been looked into at all. I understand the, the research on sleep, but all three of my kids have said, we're going to get off the bus and it's dark for a large portion of the year. So that's a concern for us. Yeah. Have we looked into that? Is that? Okay, yeah, that's more about sleep is a fact. Sleep, sleep is the priority there. Yeah. yeah. I guess the answer is we don't really know. We don't really know. That's been taken into consideration. Actually, in this initially, some of this work was initially uh, started by Terry Bain. Um, I know that Terry has, yeah, I know, but I mean, she, she's the current wizard of, of the information now, so um, we could definitely ask her. Okay. Yes? I just want to say, Claire, I don't think that's silly at all. I thought that was brilliant. I don't either, yeah. I think that's a really good point. Um, and uh, I'm a little concerned about the runners, um, because as it is now, they're running in the streets at twilight, and they're going to be running in the streets in the dark. Um, I brought this up at another school board meeting that wasn't Sauhegan, and one of the board members did talk to me afterward and assured me that this was in the works for the fall of next year. It was just the details. And I wish I could remember everything I brought up, but I, I wasn't um, 
I'm not prepared for that, but it was about safety. And she said those little details will be ironed out. <laughs> but this is definitely in the works for the fall of 2021. Yes. Okay. Fall of 2020. Oh, fall of 2021. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But I just want to just, I was just kind of concerned that those are little details, um, the safety of our students running. Not a little detail. In the streets. No. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, last question, by the way. All right. Um, so, yeah, the later start times. This, this SAU school board voted on having the later start times happen fall of 2021, right? They, direct, they directed me to put a plan together to make it happen, yes. So I, my gut as a parent says, until I know the details of how it's all supposed to happen and the details how it's supposed to work out, why did we vote on for say yes until we had the details? Uh, would you turn this around and say no? It doesn't seem to work. I don't know. Well, so I'm going to actually answer that right right now. So even if the SAU board votes to have this be a start time fall of 2021, this board still needs to vote because this is this is an actual voting board. That SAU board is is just an it's it's just a a venue for the three boards to communicate and collaborate, so you don't have chaos within the SAU, essentially. But anytime we make a decision like that, it has to then go back to the three boards. So typically, you want to come out of a board meeting like that, and you all want to be on the same page. But it still has to come back to this board for an actual vote. Um, Just to so. clarify, we voted to direct Adam to move forward in this direction and to find ways to overcome all of the obstacles. But it still has to come back to these bodies to vote. Can Simone, can Simone speak? Yeah, I'm sorry. Can, uh, can Simone speak? Oh, yeah, please. I know you said last question, but. Oh, <laughs> uh, please, go ahead. Um, I'm Simone Dodge. I'm a senior at Sauhegan. I live in Amherst. Um, I actually, this has been something that like we've been discussing in council and stuff. And it's been really cool to hear like both sides, the different information. Um, something that I've been wondering about as I've heard, like the, the qualitative data, teenagers should go to sleep later and therefore they, they do go to sleep later and therefore should be waking up later and their REM sleep is later. Um, but I really would like to know the, the quantitative data for that. So like what time, what is the exact time that teenagers should be going to sleep and should be waking up and when their REM sleep it, is taking place? Because I've just heard later and later and I don't, I don't really know what that means. So I guess that's just my question. Thanks. I can answer. Yeah. So the, uh, there are different studies, but most of them point to around 830 for a start time. So that to give you like to do a big meta, meta analysis and boil it down to one sentence, it varies, but 830 is, seems to be around the consensus for a start time. Assuming that the sleep time backs up to that, the students get up an hour, an hour and a half before that. Jim. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Simone. Um, Laura. Is it possible to get references for the research? Possible to get references? Yeah. yeah. Maybe Terry, I think Terry has. We presented those before. We can get. Yeah, those Terry, has them cause we've, <clears throat> Terry has them because we. Terry has them because we 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 did make a presentation on this a couple times at SAU, mm -hmm. so we can get those. Yep. Tim. <clears throat> so. Very interesting because I know, as Howard mentioned, that we've been looking at this for years and years, and Jeannie mentioned as well. Um, and then Terry resurrected it a couple of years ago. Um, and all the studies that we were presented with were in favor of later start times, showed you know really good reasons why. Um, and so it was kind of neat to start to see the evolution going on here at the high school of what the kids really wanted. Um, so that's really important data. And the parents obviously play a big part in that as well. Um, so to hear them uh, is very important. My question is, is these studies that we looked at a couple of years ago, whatever it was, um, if I recall, and, and, and I probably don't recall correctly, but they come from, and I don't want to sound strange, but you know, as far as coming from like the California area, right? So, you know, and not, not to anything, let's say they're in a lot of ways more progressive, right? And some, and things that they do, and it's especially from an educational standpoint, but 
looking at it also if those communities are in a more southerly latitude than we are they're going to get more daylight it's going to be easier for them to implement this kind of thing because they're not as affected as much from a daylight perspective like some of these parents have uh, expressed concerns about um, you know if we're talking about um, some northerly states doing something like this uh, you know I don't know I'd be kind of interested to see if there are many northerly states that have changed their um, start times to later because they for sure will have an impact to the end of their days Thank you. Steve uh, if I remember correctly um, Minneapolis is one of the first large districts or set of districts that adopted it I can tell you from personal experience they're four degrees north of here so <laughs> they have less sun than we do yeah I know yeah. <laughs> Interesting. thanks Steve so can I, can I make a final comment final comment all right, so Delaney, could you pull up your slide deck again? So f for me, this is about um, finding what I want. What's most important to me is that our students have the maximum quality instructional time in, f in front of a highly trained teacher. That's what I want. I want our, our students to have the most possible chance to learn something and apply it in their lives that they'll take from here. If you back up to, the, to the, some of the questions in the beginning, keep going. Next one. One more after that, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So this is a big problem for me. I have to say this is a major issue for me. It's not all about school start times, right? Maybe there's an attendance policy issue that we need to investigate. Maybe there are other factors we need to remedy. But for me, I have a problem with this, right? And I've got student, all of my kids play sports. So they're all in, they're all going to do after school sports. And I understand that was the biggest factor against why parents wouldn't support a school start time change. 67% said because of athletics. I get that, but I need students in front of teachers for quality time. There are other issues that affect that as well. How much our teachers take for professional development time, right? Things that we can control, we have to look at. And then the next slide as well, about level of exhaustion. Kids sleeping in class and being too tired to function normally in class. I am expected as your school superintendent to deliver exceptional academic results, the best possible academic experience for our students. And there are some things I can control and some things I cannot, right? There are lots of things about what comes from home, what comes our students bring with them to school that I cannot control. Um, but school start time is something that is a lever for change that's appropriate. And this is all about a great compromise, right? Because what we're talking about is 8.30 or 8.45 really because our elementary schools share our buses with us and we need to coordinate with them otherwise it costs us more money right so we're looking at the solution that doesn't cost more money we don't think um, and uh, maybe that means we need to look at something that does cost more money if people are vehemently opposed and students are really opposed to this but one way or another I feel compelled to find a way to get students having more quality instructional time in front of our highly trained instructors and that's really my motivation behind all of this and so why it may be unpopular for some or might, might affect athletics or might affect other things my job is to find the way to ameliorate as many of those considerations as possible to increase some of these these numbers here so that that's really where I'm coming from I think uh, I really appreciate the data Delaney and you guys did a great job framing the questions asking the questions getting data from students um, as we move forward uh, what I've asked uh, Principal Hagen and his team is is there a middle ground that we can investigate what I mean by that is we have an eight period day seven of which are for academic classes kids usually stay here about four years most kids are on the four-year plan um, maybe the steel kids take a little bit longer but um, so that's 28 class academic class period students can take during high school the the graduation requirement is what bill 22.22.5 right so there are open periods of time that we know are available for students that maybe have a consideration like work or some other uh, activity that we need to account for so we're investigating is there a great compromise in all of this that doesn't cost more money and allows students to still work the club time etc so we're looking at all of that so please keep feeding us your feedback because it's really really helpful in finding the right way to make this work thank you okay Great. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for everybody for their comments as well. Um, all right. We still have several agenda items. I'm just going to quickly go to the dual enrollment and advanced placement for a moment here. So the reason we put this on the agenda 
was because, and we can decide this as a board now or not, um, the reason we put this on the agenda was because when we looked at the strategy for the school system, the strategy again is a, a, um, a personalized pathway for every student, right? Administration came back with four strategies that we're going to look to employ over the next few years. One is an anchoring adult. One is a plan for every student. One is the MTSS supports, uh, investments in mental health. And then the last one was um, providing an opportunity through dual enrollment to have a portion of our students graduate with what it would amount to an associate's degree. Um, I think the, Adam said by 2026 he wanted 50 percent. I think that those numbers and the details are still up for debate depending on the feedback we get from the community. Facilities is number five. What's that? Facilities is number five. Facilities is number five. Yes, thank you. So that goes without saying. So um, my question for Adam was, I know this is, a, this is down the line, my question for Adam was if we have dual enrollment, and we have advanced placement, do we do both? Do we do one? What are the advantages of doing some versus the other? Have we even thought that out? And I was going to ask him about that. <laughs> he sensed your question. But he knew it was coming, evidently, yeah. Um, so I did want to have a little bit of a discussion about it. Um, are you prepared to talk about this at all? Or OK. So, could you just give us a quick synopsis, and then if any board members have anything that they want to add, I won't have public comment following this because it's so really so far down the line, but I think it's important for everybody to hear. Mm -hmm. So why don't you start? Yeah, um, and I don't know if Karen Chininis is still here or if she had to go home. Oh, good. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Feel free to jump in. Karen really oversees um, our um, dual enrollment programs and um, also supports with program of studies. Um, so currently, we have um, courses that are dual enrollment courses. That means that students take a class here at the high school, but they're also at the same time receiving college credit. Um, we have two um, different options in a sense with dual enrollment. We have some through Nashua Community College, that's our Running Start program. And then we also have um, relationships with other colleges, um, SNHU and a few other colleges that um, work with us um, for students to receive credit in those courses. So um, there's often a very uh, low tuition fee for a dual enrollment course because the um, college uh, is really um, basically working with us for our teachers to be the adjunct professors. So we have increased the number of dual enrollment courses over the past few years. That was a goal of ours to do. Um, so we have um, worked pretty hard to do that. We've gotten a, a few new courses added um, over the past few years. We also have some AP courses. And really there are, um, in a sense, you know, benefits to the AP, um, one of them. Um, our teachers don't have to be um, an adjunct professor. Um, we're able to send them to our AP training, and um, they're able to run those AP courses. Uh, but the dual enrollment, you're, you're really able to get a transcript from that um, college or university with that course on it, which for AP, um, you have to pass the AP test. Colleges have different requirements for whether or not that will be credit bearing or just allow you to um, fulfill um, a requirement. Um, so it, it's been nice to be able to have both pieces, you know, both AP as well as dual enrollment courses. I think that's been an important strategy because not all of our teachers are always going to qualify to be adjunct professors. So having both routes um, has been something that we've been um, really wanting to provide so students can access either one or both of those pathways. So, uh, and I know that um, Adam and I have been working um, on looking at how we might be able to expand that dual enrollment program and partnering with um, a local university to do that um, work. So that is really looking at how do we expand out even more fully to that and partner um, more deeply on that piece. And I know Adam Here. just came back in too. So if you want to jump in as well. <laughs> we were filling in um, while we were waiting for you to, to So while, he, while Adam yeah. gets back to his chair. <laughs> Um, uh, I think what you said, Christine, is right on target. Both of those different programs, AP and dual enrollment, really played some similar role, but also very different roles, too. 
um, because colleges have their own individual policies for AP as well as for dual enrollment, there is no set general rule for accepting credits under any of those programs by, you know, by a, a group of schools. They all have their individual policies. So um, I, I, I think, I don't know, but I've heard a, a little bit of rumor that people are concerned that we are uh, dropping the AP program. That's not true. Um, that's not a conversation that we've had. We feel really strongly that the um, having a rich um, AP program, which we do have about 15 AP classes here, um, is extremely important for our students to be able to engage in that program. Um, but do you know there, there is uh, kind of a twofold um, issue here? One is. Um, having a rigorous course load, students um, looking favorable to colleges, and then the other piece is uh, actually earning college credit. Which, although they're related, they're also two separate things. So there is no plan, um, no conversation to drop AP courses at this point. And uh, like I said, they, they both play an important role. And, and we've been I've been very pleased that we've grown um, the AP program as well as the dual enrollment program over the last few years. Um, hopefully we'll be able to continue that and offer those options to those students so that they have different paths that they pursue. Thank you, Karen. Any uh, questions from the board with regard to this? David. You're welcome. Uh, Karen. Um, you know, the, the AP classes have a very, very strictly defined curriculum. Yeah. But what I'm curious about is do the colleges, do the equivalent college courses have a similar, I mean, because every college is different. Yeah. So in order for um, a dual enrollment course to be approved by the college, um, the curriculum has to um, be the same as a current course that they're teaching at the college level. Um, and also, the instructor has to be approved, as Christine said, as an adjunct. So they have uh, a rigorous process for that to happen, no matter what college um, you're under. So the Running Star program is under the New Hampshire State University system, the community colleges, and because they have matriculation agreements with Keene Plymouth and UNH, they have very strict guidelines for um, approval, as does SNU. So, so both the curriculum and the instructor have to be approved um, as a college level course by that institution. So, which I guess my question is sort of which comes first? You know, there's um, I'll just pick a class. There's uh, calculus BC, and does uh, Southern New Hampshire's uh, freshman, sophomore level cl uh, calculus class cover the same material that Calculus BC does, and how do we know that? So we know that because they have to approve the, the syllabus and the curriculum that that course teaches. So AP Calculus AB mm -hmm. is um, also approved by SNU as a college level course. Um, they don't call it AP because they call right. it Calculus 1 at SNU. So that curriculum has to match the, that course that's being taught as, at SNU, as well as the teacher has to be an approved instructor. Isn't that an AP class, though? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's both. It's both, yeah. So that was an example cause, yeah. um, with the SNU. Um, we have a lot more to get to. So I, I think the important thing that you had mentioned is we're not dropping AP at the high school. So. Right. That, that's, that was the important <laughs> point um, for us. The, the one question I do have, maybe Karen, I'm sorry, maybe Christine can answer too, is in the, um, that is that I was talking to Laura, and you had done some research around this as well, that in order for students, if they're involved in the dual enrollment program, in order for them to earn credit and have that credit be transferable to a college once they graduate from this high school and move on to the college of their choice that instructors, um, I think you had said they need to be almost like 
employees of the college, right? Is that what you had said based on your research or no? No, it was the running start with Nashville Community College requires them to have a master's. Mm -hmm. SNHU, it doesn't have to be in their field. Okay. So that's not necessarily true because we've approved cor the course through SNU. Um, both institutions and most in institutions that offer dual enrollment they have to, the instructors have to have have a graduate degree and and most institutions prefer for that graduate to degree to be in that specific area so if you're teaching psychology they want to see a graduate degree in psychology many high school teachers um, have a master's of teaching or master's of education so what they do is they review all the coursework and they want to make sure that the teacher has at least a good number of courses within that um, area that they're teaching both SNU and um, and Running Start have worked with us to assist us in um, helping teachers and uh, to to get that qualification so to give you an example again I use psychology Jess Tremblay um, was has a graduate degree it was not in psychology she had a number of psychology courses in her graduate program and had and they advised her to take two other um, pro, uh, courses before uh, she was approved so they'll work with us um, to get the teachers appro approved at that level Thank you, Karen. And David has one last question, then we'll wrap up. A real quick question. Um, I guess this is for you, Christine. I was told that the fees that are that are uh, required by the university or the college that we're associated with is like $100 or something like that, and that's picked up by the state. So, so there is no additional cost to us, the high school? So SNU is $100 for a three-credit course, Running Start. Um, the uh, A couple years ago, the state is funding not a private institutions like SNU, um, but they're uh, they're funding the Running Start program, um, and we're, they're able to pay for two STEM classes per year for students. So if a student is taking AP Stats and uh, AP Chem, they'll cover the cost of those, so the student doesn't have to pay for that for those two classes. So, there's so that's a, two STEM classes each year for a student. Okay, so there's an economic a benefit start if, we, if we go with uh, National Community College versus... So that is really a benefit of the Running Star program um, is that the students have those free courses. Yeah, in fact, when we first started um, and reaching out to colleges, uh, that uh, grant was not yet funded. Um, and we started a relationship with SNU with the AP Cal class, uh, expecting that to grow. But then this happened, and we kind of stayed with um, Running Start for those science and math classes. Thank you, Karen. OK. Um, so let's move on. Thanks for everybody, by the way. So let's move on to the next agenda item, which is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as written? So moved. Motion from Steve. Do I have a second? Uh, George okay all in favor all opposed okay unanimous oh I, I didn't get you Dave <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Laura was Laura did you vote I'm fine okay sorry okay so we have approved the consent agenda moving on to the deliberative session planning Here's what I'd like to propose, if we could take a five minute recess because some of us, I think, need to use the facilities. So let's do that and reconvene in five minutes.
put something in the yeah, suburban gymnasium. Yeah, you might want to put something the room. leveling the tax burden thing. Because how, how do we know what's enough? Or too yeah. much? Yeah. So how, what, what, do you, what should I include here? Cal Adam is part a good explanation. Year. It's part of the tw it's the twenty year the 20 tax year. level thing. Yeah. George's question was, how do we know one hundred thousand dollars is what we need? So do we want to include language in here that explains that? And how would we do that? Is it too much? Too little? No. So I, I, uh, I would hope that both the Emerson and Sohegan board say that it's about six hundred eighty-five thousand dollars a year every year for the next twenty years to properly fund the capital maintenance projects we need to have. It's a combined 685 between Amherst and Sohegan. It's going to fluctuate between the two. Okay. It's always going to equal about that amount. This year is kind of the first drop in the bucket. So we're kind of split. Okay. Yep. Yep, yep. So I'll add a sentence in here that basically says something to the effect that the all of the schools within the SAU need this 685. Well, at least in Amherst, and our portion this year is 100,000. That will change next year. Something like that. Does that make some, sense? It'll give us some context. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, Jim, is it the context that you're trying to low level this for the taxpayer? Yes. 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 I would use That's something. The point. Yeah, low level. something in there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Consistent tax impact. Yes. Yeah. Collaborating with other. With yes, use the word cool. collaboration the and school consistent. school district. In, collabor in collaboration with the Amherst yes. School District. Collaboration is good. Consistent. Stop. Collaboration. The result will be to <laughs> level <laughs> that the tax burden over the next that, 20 years. Yeah. Did you get that? I, why, <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> so, Adam, why would you stop at 20 years? Because this is as far as you can see out. No, that's a great point. So, yes, I, a, a fair right. statement would be it's $685,000 every year into the future. Okay, that yeah. makes more sense to me. We have a spreadsheet that goes 20 years out. It's very easy to say it keeps going. Well, but I mean, you know, it's it's um, what you're anticipating over the life of the school system, really. I'm just kidding. And that you need a yeah. consistent That's right. set of money and, to refresh and, things. And realistically, every five years we'll refresh it and make sure the number is the right number still and all of that. And it, it does escalate with inflation. Yeah. So. yeah. It's got a 2% escalator in it. All right, so no major problems with this? No. Okay. My major so, problem is you're limiting it to 20 years. I would just say, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying that. What's that? You thought you meant to. That's the major problem you have. We have no problems. No, you I don't know. Just say it. There's somebody who's got it every year. 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, 20 we have a 20 year plan. So yeah, we're done. Really yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're done in the future. Yep. Uh, I will find that and make sure. Yeah. So I'll, I'll strike that. Okay. Jim. Can yes. you distribute a copy of the PPC agreement to the rest of the board? Yes. Do we have? Well, the, there there is no PPC agreement. I'm sorry. Well, the, the question was, Laura wants a copy of the PPC it's agreement. The policy. The policy. The policy. The you can see the current policy. The, 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 there's, there's the agreement that was reached in the PPC room. It's a three-page document, which I, I can give you. I don't have it with me. No, I would I love to read it. I, yeah, see yeah. How every, it every, every, everyone should see it. Can you forward it to everyone? I can, yes, I can. I no, I what, you why were... limit it to Laura? I no, I sent it to you and Pim because you were going to go meet with oh. the AFC. Okay, I thought everybody. Uh, but yeah, no. That's everyone. what it is, right? Yeah. It's the three, pager, the, well, three page. Yeah. Three page, yeah. but, but, yeah. but big spacing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I, I can say to everyone else, it's 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 not it's not a secret. It's just, in fact, I had copies to bring with me the night I wasn't there at the meeting. So. Okay. okay. All right. Speaker so let's phone. make sure the entire board gets a copy of that at some point. Um, David. No, I don't want to say. That. No. All right. So in terms of preparing for the upcoming deliberative, um, is the best way to do it? Do we have the current deck? Current most. You sent me the current most copy. Uh, could you? I think. How would you want to? My, wanna do my suggestion is that you d determine who's going to speak out which topic, yep. and then have each one of those people collaborate with with Michelle between now and Monday on that specific part, and right. then send a, a draft out to the entire board uh, once it, that's been done. Because so, doing it here is not very efficient. No, I understand. that's why I just wanted to pull us. See if we have the slide next, so we can make sure that we just rolled through it. And, is it significantly uh, different than what we presented at public hearing? No, I just added, I, I tweaked to add the votes, you know, um, recommend, recommendations. I added um, a couple slides on, um, let me look at this, on the totals, the Warren articles, you know, shows the 
three of them and what the total would be, uh, a revenue slide, a tax rate, estimated tax rate impact slide. Okay. Um, and then I didn't know if you wanted a tax rate history. Um, yeah. Sometimes. I'd like to see. I'd like to see yeah. the data on that. I mean, I can put one together, and then you guys can decide if you want it in there or not. You know, sometimes it's too much. Too sometimes it's just too much. Too many numbers and. The well, if it's too many numbers and it's confusing. There's yeah. no. But I think you know transparency around budget impact is important, David. Um, there were some concerns I had about the slides I was presenting. First of all, one of them you, it was really hard to understand and read, and I and I'd like to change it maybe in the two slides with you know different scales on them so that you could tell what you're looking at. Can I can we get together tomorrow sometime and then just go over that and you have a time when so I don't want to do it here because yeah, it's just touch base after the meeting. what's that? We can touch base after the meeting and figure right. out a time. So why don't we do it this way? Is everybody comfortable with? who presented the last time and the slides that they presented the last time and do we want to keep it that way? Or does, somebody, does anybody else want um, to have a piece of the presentation? I'm, I'm good. You're good. I know you're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good. Why are you good now, Laura? All of a sudden you're good with yeah, this. George thought it was perfect. <laughs> We're going to get her up there at some point. George thought it was perfect. All right. Tim? Oh. It's all matter to me. You're good? Yeah. I'm good. Good? Yeah. You guys are good? I'm, I'm good, unless you want me to do so, more. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. So I had some, like, things that I heard that I want to make some changes yeah. to my presentation. Sure. So, I mean, I don't think I talked enough about the working jointly with Amherst. Yep. Um, so I want to add that to my presentation. So as long as there's no objections. So I'm going to fill in <coughs> in what I talked about. Um, I was a capital maintenance plan. Okay. So, and then for David, I'd mentioned to David on his, um, I thought it would be worthwhile to talk about, and Kim's probably going to bring this up too, in the cost per pupil calculation that um, special education. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Is yeah, right. not. It's part of the, it's not part of the cost per pupil. If you send students right, out right. of district. Yeah. Explain that, right. Yep, and I think Kim probably yeah. had other things to talk about that. So we had, I had, talked to Adam and, and Amy was there as well. Um, sorry. Okay. I had asked for a, a, if you guys could bring a bunch of different calculations to this meeting so we could decide whether or not it would should go into the deliberative slides. Um, are you guys able to do any of that? Did you talk to your staff? Uh, I'm not sure. Is that in the updated deck I just forwarded along? I'm sorry. It was, you were distracted yes. by the airplane. Because I, I couldn't hear. So what was the question? I'm sorry. So I had asked Adam for a, a bunch of different um, calculations for um, cost, per, uh, cost per pupil and in various forms, fit form factors of that. Um, because when we were at the advisory finance committee, they were bringing up different things. So we were like, okay, well, let's let's show it in almost yeah. every iteration you can think of, to because people are going to ask those questions, right? So if we can show it every different way from Sunday, then we preemptively answer those questions. So um, I don't know, and, uh, and so when we were at our last um, joint facilities meeting. I asked Adam to see if he could help ask you guys to get those figures um, and calculations. So I don't know if that was done, and maybe they are in the new slide deck. I have no idea. I'm I don't sure. have the various different scenarios yet. I'll, I'll touch base just to make sure that I'm capturing, with, with Adam to make sure I'm capturing all the ones that you would like to see. So it's basically what, what Dave, what you were looking for as well, like the different cost per pupil, you know, with. Um, what were the questions ed without special ed? Uh, just diff all the different iterations. So I want to see, you know, take total budget, divide by total number of students. That's what everyone seems to do, how they calculate their cost per pupil when, in fact, that's not how the state does it. Right. So we do it that way. We do it with special ed, without special ed. We can do it, you know, the way the state does it. And, you know, so show all these different iterations. So because some people understand the way it should be calculated. Some people do the easy calculation, say, you know, I don't, you know, why is it so high, when really, in fact, 
when you look at that compared to other, because they're taking that number, their simple number, and comparing it to what they see on the state website, which is calculated differently. So I'm just trying to, again, be proactive about those questions and showing all the different things so they can say, yeah, we just showed you on slide 15 or whatever. Right, okay. so like for instance, Bedford has a bond. Right. So they're yeah. still paying taxes on that, but it's not included in their cost right. per people. The only other comparison we'll be able to do is total budget ver divided by total students. We won't be able to take out special ed and compare that out because we don't have access to the data from the other school districts. Right. Mm -hmm. right. right. We can do cost per pupil and we can do all in cost per pupil. Those are the two that we can. Well, that's why I was, I've been, uh, I'll come back to you in a second, David, is that I, and maybe I'm, maybe this is wrong for me to think this, but I've always felt that the best way to present where our budget is relative to the taxpayer is, is by looking at the tax impact, like what, our, what the impact of our budget is on what they pay in taxes, right? And the most simplified view, looking at cost per pupil and all of these other things is difficult because it's, I mean, it, honestly, it's like taco salad. It, it changes and depends on, you know, a restaurant you go to. So, but if there's a, I mean, am I wrong or? No, no you're to, absolutely To your right. point, it's easier to look at from a historical perspective, what percentage that comprise maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago versus now. It gives it a little bit more context because you're right, with inflation and everything else, it's 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 tough. But you okay, a thousand dollars now was worth a lot more a thousand dollars fifteen years ago. Right. Okay. So to say that it's this versus that, it's to, I think overall you have to look at it globally and say, mm -hmm. okay, now it makes I don't know, 5% of a total tax base, whereas years ago, it was four and a half. Okay, in total dollars, that may be a lot of money, but in the overall grand scheme of things, it's not a heck of a lot. Yeah, especially given special education, the more you have to pay for special education. Right, but that's why I have to, piece of the pie. Again, again, people aren't looking at it as, okay, you know, I'm paying this much for this. this how much is it out of everything? How much, what does that make up? Uh, David and then Steve. So um, the cost per pupil, is very regulated. I mean, it, you don't you don't get to futz around with that. That's a hard, fast number. It's been the same number, generated the same way since night in 2002. I think it is at least that. At yeah. least that. So at least, the data on the website is 2002. Okay. It's in an Excel spreadsheet. You put the numbers in the DOE 25 the way you're supposed to put them in. That gets shipped to the state. They plug it into this formula, and you get a number. It's a cost per pupil. There are anomalies with it. I will. I agree with you that there are anomalies, especially if you choose to strategically go with special education on the inside. You hire more staff to do that. It's a better, lower cost, lowers your cost overall. And I think that's true. But people have got to recognize there really isn't anything else that's comparative. True. There's nothing else that's comparative. There's not. So I don't know. I don't know how to say it any differently to the uh, finance committee or what they want to look at, or I don't even know what they want to look at, but that is the number that the state goes by. And the reason, I agree. So the reason why yeah. cost for people came into being was people were trying yes. to find a way to compare, mm -hmm. and tax rate couldn't do it, because we're at different stages of re being reassessed, right? Exactly. Right. so it's not equalized. Mm -hmm. There's a whole equalization process, but that's a mess. And then people started to look at total dollars spent, and people like SAU1 and Conval said, wait a minute. We send buses further than anyone else in the state. So our bus transportation dollars are much higher. Then another district said, wait a minute, we send so many kids out of district, it's not fair to include that. So then there was this formula developed over time, right? right. It's and supposed it's, to be the great common equalizer. It's, it's highly regulated. There are some anomalies in it and when you have shared facilities. How much is shared is the middle school paid for, the SAU, yeah. or whatever. I mean, there's anomalies like that. But they're very small, they're sub 1%. Yeah. So, yeah. Dave, so I, I, I totally agree, and, and okay. I think that you're you're right on. The problem is, is you're going to get people that show up at the deliberative that don't know that they're not going to pull out a deal of twenty five and start to figure out what the the true Steve cost. Will. That's fine, <laughs> but someone else is going to say. Will. Hey, <laughs> someone else is going to take the budget. They're going to take the number of students. They're going to do a simple equation. They're going to say, Holy crap. the other thing. The other thing is, it has the measure of efficiency. It really is the measure of efficiency that you can use from school to school to school. It's the I'm cost per head. I'm not debating that. Uh -huh. You have to understand that. I know, I know, but I think we as a board need to say there's one standard that we use. Yes. You know, All right. and well, it's then, the state okay, standard. That's fine. Then someone has to also say, and you, 
and be adamant you cannot take the budget and divide it by the, the population because it's not an accurate representation of the cost per pupil. Period. Right. Well, I, I don't I want to hear say, another thing about it. No, what I would say was go at it, but you can't compare it to anything. You know, do what you want to do. Okay. Because I, you know, I've tried that. Okay. <laughs> it I doesn't we, work. I think we agree. Okay. It's an imperfect. It's an imperfect statistic, and yet it's the only statistic we have. Right. So, Steve. It, it's a variation of the same nail I want to hammer on, <laughs> which is, Dave, Dave and I agree 100 percent this time on one thing. Uh, that it, it, you can't make comparisons. We can do a time series of our own gross cost per pupil, but we cannot tease out anybody else's equivalent because there's a million right. ways you can do a DOE 25 in a K-12 district. Yeah, that, that is true. You'll never be able to get a comparable high school only cost per pupil. Yeah, mm -hmm. ten VAs will do ten different DOE 25s. Yeah. That's true. Hey, and Jim, is there something in the just like the default the, budget or Adam? Um, like over a five-year span, what the overall budget, what the increases were? Over a five-year span? Or five or yeah. ten years. I think the analysis. Because to me, that's a better predictor I, I, because if the analysis your base did was we only, our budget only went up like 1.2 percent. Right, right. But I think from, oh, take it from a time view because if your base is higher, your increases could have been nominal. They're still always going to look higher. So if I'm 15 percent higher than the next individual, but yet my increase has been one and a half, two percent, Theirs have been three and a half, four. I'm still well within, say, inflationary factors, but because my base has always been higher, I'm always going to appear more expensive. So I think it's it's it tells a story of how efficient we've been with these funds as well. When you give it from that, so not just focus on CPP, but look at okay, this has been our increase for the last few yeah. years, and this carve out special ed. And we could talk about special ed, but look at these are controllable costs. Special ed we cannot control. There's a reason why when we do EBITDA calculation, we pull out taxes because yeah. we can't control taxes. You can to some extent, but you know Washington has a lot of say. So what can I control? And this is what I've been able to do, and that to me tells me how efficient I've been. Yeah. So that I was my that was my my point before about inputs in a public school. Right, right. But if your base is higher, you're always going to look more expensive. So I think. Yeah. What have our increases been over the last couple of years? And I think if we talk a little bit about that, I think that may. It's not going to take all of the angst out of it, but I think that will say, hey, you guys are, are doing your job. So where does that sit? That sits. Uh, you, do you have that, Michelle? George's comment? The increases over the last couple yeah, of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, it would be nice if we could have a comparator, too, if that was possible. But. Uh, yeah, I would start at least and say, hey, look, you know, this and has been. put that graph up in the past. I have. So we have, we have it. We I, thought, it. I thought you yeah. have, but I'm yeah. Yeah. We also had um, someone in Michelle's office put together a 10-year history that does break down special ed versus regular ed. Yeah, we have yeah, all that in a spreadsheet yeah. that's, that's oh, okay. configurable. Um, and we've also looked at the tax rates and the tax assessments of our competing towns, Bedford, Hanover, you know, whatever. And that's it's a fool's errand because um, I've tried to find a story in there, and you can't find one because the tax rate in any town incrementally goes up and then all of a sudden drops. Right. Because the reassessment happens assessment. and everyone's on a different schedule right so they look at total dollars assessed meaning the, the amount of tax dollars raised for local education meaning after the state contributes after the revenue sources are contributed how much you have to raise in taxes in a particular town and looking at that's interesting but doesn't tell a story either because you look at bedford all of a sudden it goes up by five million why is that they built Bedford high school they start taking a bond payment right I, so, I understand that but I, I guess what i'm trying is to try to get away from the tax perspective just Actual dollars that you spend our, our budget. If we're running at a one and a half, two percent clip, hey, there's not much you can do to get below that unless you're lopping heads off like nobody. That's wants. exactly the story. Yeah, that's right. But, but, but that's what I'm saying. Here. It, it's, the, the, our cost per pupil skyrocketed. No, I understand. And it. the reason it skyrocketed is because our number of students are per. But, but, but what I'm saying CPP is. CPP is. Right. Per saying pupil, is get away from our pupils went down down the no, tubes. I, I understand that, but at the end of the day, there's only certain things you can control. And if I'm in, if I'm a resident of Amherst, and I happen to be in Mount Vernon, and I'm looking at my budget, okay, some things go up 10 percent, some go down 3 percent. Overall, my budget's one and a half, two percent. Well, what's my inflationary rate? You know what? That's not bad. What did you do the year before? It it it, it tells me what 
how efficient they've been the last number of years. If I see a spike of 5%, okay, what happened that year? But I think when you talk about CPP, you're right, because it's very confusing. What are you guys spending every year? Well, see, that's so... So wait, hold on a second, Dave. So the, the, where, where George is going is exactly the point I've been trying to make about cost per pupil all along, which is, which is, so you're right, cost per pupil, our cost per pupil went up because our students declined dramatically, right? And well, now it's leveled out, Jim. That's right, the point. Right, but my thing is that if we're, this goes back to we should be having a set of key results, and I know you're developing those things, but we should have a set of key results, and those key results should look at, should control for what, uh, what our objectives are. So meaning, if you're, you're looking at CPP, it's really challenging to say, well, what do I do about this metric? Because we can't really control for the number of students. You can't, it, it's difficult to really carve into the, the fact that you've got a staff that's experienced and highly paid, because the only way to resolve that is really by cutting heads. So it just makes, it makes it difficult. It, whereas if you look at another metric like this, then you can look at that and say, if your objective is to be efficient with the budget, that metric makes a lot more sense. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Because you could control for it. Yeah, I mean, and we have controlled for it this year. I mean, all honesty, how are you going to drive a CPP rate down? How are you going to drive it down? You just have to eat well, you have either to get a bunch of kids in here, or you're, you're, you're going to hire Having robots staff. as teachers. To cut staff. And, yeah, and cut staff. So the, okay, so forget that. So throw that out the window. Well, well, what, what is a better did. measure? What is a better well, measure? just did. Excuse me? We just did cut. I know, it, and, so. and, and our CP rate, I'm sure, is still much higher than. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, what are you going to do? for electricity one day a month. <laughs> 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 All right, so let's. And, and I'll cut your water bill in half. Let's pull this. Let's check a couple of right, in half. <laughs> let's pull this back in. So, we want, to, we want to look at this. We want to look at this as part of the presentation. We want to look at what Amy. And I have another one, too. What wants to look at as part of the presentation. Are you good with the PPC stuff that you on your end? I, I, I'm fine. I. I Okay. I, I think I didn't get a lot of questions, and um, I, I'm very happy given the presentation. Well, the, the the only thing the only thing I would recommend as an addition, and then I'll come back to you, Amy, is um, Adam and I are going to do the op you know the opening stuff like we did the last time. The cost per pupil, the cost per pupil present, um, not the, um, the default the default calculation rather, which was David's responsibility. We need to add, and I'm going to send this slide to you, Michelle. What's very effective is when you can take, we used to have a matrix of all of the different things that you would lose. Now, it's only $5,000 this year. Well, but it's the pluses and minuses. I mean, right. There, There's there, deltas all the way down. All the way down. Right. So if we could, we, we need a slide like that so David has some, he has some context to, re, you know, right. you need a little bit more. You leave a bit a little bit more there in that piece. So, so the message is is that, in a way, we got lucky by not lucky. We were fortunate that that the um, the the, uh, the difference between the budget and the default was only fifty seven hundred sixty five dollars. But that wasn't magic. That was because we had some numbers that were going up, and a lot of numbers that were going down. And the difference was the $5,700. Right. It just didn't, it's not because the budget is just going down. Right. 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 And, we, and we want to be able to communicate that. Right. So I, I, would, I would like to see the list of things that went up. You had it. You had it at one point. Yep. You know what I'm talking about, Michelle? Is that, is that something you can do? Yeah. Put together? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll meet with you and talk to you. Yeah. All right. And then, and then Amy has another request. So when Pim and I went to advisory finance, um, we... Cool received feedback that they would recommend that we put a little more context around the $485,000 staffing reduction. So I know it's challenging to get too specific, but I think we need to give more information than just we're cutting $485,000. So I don't know what others' thoughts are, but that was, I, I, we heard that loud and clear yeah. from, um, from Several. What's wrong, Amy? What's wrong? This is Adam's words. What's wrong with the notion that you know we really need to see the master schedule and you know uh, pluses and minuses in enrollment and students because the enrollment in, in the classes drives what we need to supply. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you know, yep. um, I think that's an important message to understand that we just don't put those classes out there and run them no matter what. They have to be some judgment to that. Yep. And we think they're 
because of the enrollment that we have, we have five head count. And this is the story that you gave me, Adam. So I'm just. Yeah. Well, I think there's there's more to it than that, and I think having some context around that that you know we've made some deliberate um, decisions with offering early retirement so that we'll have some staff turnover. Um, so, but in addition to that, we did hear concerns about particular administrative positions that may not um, happen and folks want assurances that safety and security will not be compromised. No. Exactly. So whether we can say specifics or not, I think we need, we do owe it to the public to sure. s make those um, statements that we will not be sacrificing mm -hmm. safety and security. Well, That's you made cool. that, when Jeannie asked the question, you, you made that statement. Yeah, no, I'm just asking to add it to the presentation. Okay. By somebody. You want me to I'm do not, that or? I don't know where that $485,000 comes up in the presentation. I don't know who's talking about It's up that. toward the front. Yeah, uh, that would be me. Okay. Um, what can we say about that? Because we, I can bet that we are going to get questions on Only it, that we're so. not going to sacrifice safety and security. I mean, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that it's based on. I mean, even if we were going to talk about individual personnel, in that particular case, we wouldn't. We're not going to outline exactly what we do around safety yeah. right. and security. Well, my fear, to my your point. My fear is, and I'll, I'll be careful what I say here, but my fear is that the concerns might be that they're trying to protect individual personnel and we have to make we can't make decisions because of that you know it's our decision to make a decision it's our decision to make the best budget decision for the school and it's his job to implement it right right so it's not their job their job is not i mean <laughs> i'll show you they're not collaborators with us on making the budget right. their their job is to provide input and, but when it gets to collaboration, there's no collaboration between the Advisory Finance Committee and us. It's not a negotiated event. It's not a negotiated event, right. no. Yeah. No, I agree. So. I just, one person's comment rang true to me that we should be prepared to make some general statements about Fair enough. what our plans are. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. so, so we we can build that and in. And even if, even if that's waiting until spring, until we know, but that we will not be sacrificing mm -hmm. Um, the well-being of our students. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, all right. right. Is that about yeah. what you had yeah. heard? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Laura. Um, your statement where you make no new expenditures are required. Yes. I think that's really broad, and we've already known we already know some expenditures have happened, as part of the PPC agreement, as part of the extended learning or the competency-based masters that's going on at the school. So no new expenditures are required is really broad. No major shifts. No yeah. How do I say that? No uh, significant changes to the budget or. Yeah. Wait. You know what I, you know what I want to say mm -hmm. with regard to that though. Just the essence. Um, budget right now requires no major investment. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It it's will. Yeah, no new investments. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's see. Yeah. Major. Major investment. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Does that sound better? Yeah. Um, yeah. Laura? Um, yeah, I think that I just. To support I, that, the mastery learning piece specifically in this budget. The Lord, Is that accurate? The Lord Taylor Center for Competency Based Education <laughs> <laughs> will be funded in the future. Laura Taylor Mastery Learning Center. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, let's try to wrap this up because we do have to go to non public briefly. David. I do. Uh, Adam, I would. Um, I had asked you about this before, and I, I'm going to ask again. One of the bit, one of the things that we've done in this budget is collaborated mm -hmm. with, you know, the Amherst School District, and I think that collaboration really needs to come out stronger, in yeah. my opinion. And I already, I already said that. What? On the capital but you mean you mean more than just capital maintenance? You mean the whole budget? yeah I, yeah oh. exactly staffing. Yeah, you know that's we good. you know the emphasis that we if we we if we think or believe that educating kids better downstream, you know we will reap a better product upstream. Yeah, you know and we'll produce a better product upstream. So can you make and a note like that, uh, that SAUI budget slide? Can you just make a note? Yeah, I think that's good. You know, and then and since we believe that, we're gonna. 
we're going to, it's one of the reasons we're doing the four, uh, 475,000 or yeah. whatever it is, yeah. yep. is because we think that that contributes to that yeah. realignment. <laughs> we're lowering budgets so that they can raise budgets. Yeah, I think that's a good point, David. Because after I had that discussion with you about, you know, your, your belief that we our need to do that, and then we sat down at the Fort Jerry meeting, it became so much more productive, you know? Yeah. And so... And we, we want to deliver the best overall product. It's not just South Hegan High School we want to deliver a good product for. It's the, the whole school system. Yeah. Also, your collaboration on the timing with your yeah. agreements. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I hate to yeah, bring a little thing like this up, but one thing, in order to get calculus BC taught in a large enough number, we need to prepare kids down a lot right. lower, Absolutely. faster. So that education 100%, process, David, you what's know, that? You know I'm with you on that. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> that, but that collaboration needs to come out too. Yeah. That we we yeah. want to produce kids. We want 20 kids into calculus BC or physics. Uh, yeah, physics. Like physics. With BC. Yeah. BC. Yeah. <laughs> DC. No, I'm yeah. just. Yeah. So if you you know there are lots of dimensions to this yeah. collaboration business. I disagree. Yeah. I want 250 kids at AP Well, okay. Ah. Well, that's true. Well, I, I agree with that, too. <laughs> okay. So Big let's, data management. Yeah. Let's, let's close this up. Let's start to work on this. Michelle has a lot of notes. I've taken some notes. I've taken notes on the changes requested in this document. This will be in the deliberative guide. This will also go to, um, this will also go to uh, tomorrow, um, the Amherst Thanks. Citizen. Thank you. Man, it's getting, getting late. Um, so I'll do this tonight, and I'll get this over to um, Cliff Ann. Yeah, Cliff Ann, tomorrow. Man. Wow. Okay. Jim. Yes. Can I make one more comment? Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Just based on our discussion, it is clear to me that you need to make minutes of your four chair meetings and make it available to the public. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, is there any, can, we, can we do that? It's um, not really a meeting. If it's a subcommittee of the SAU board, then perhaps it would be subject to that, but um, it's not, no actions are being taken, no motions are being made, no. We're just putting agendas together. Yeah. We're putting agendas together and we're talking about like the stuff that, that David talks about in which we come back and we talk about it at the board meeting anyway. <coughs> so. To me, but. I just think you should be upfront. If you're gonna have transparency to the public, um, you should be upfront. So you're saying just minutes? How would you like? How would you like to see that? Well, even if it's just email to the board members, it would be helpful. But what what happens in the meeting? You guys get it in the agenda packet. I mean, you get everything we talk about is in the agenda packet. Have you guys not felt that? Is, is there? A, is this a another prevailing opinion that what's discussed at the four chairs meeting is? Problematic or not transparent? Right. I don't know what's discussed at the fortune. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 said, I said this the other, at the SAU meeting the other night when you we weren't there. Yeah. I, I did it as, as the uh, Southern chair for like six years. It was just mechanics. It was like there's no decisions made. It, it doesn't feel. Nor can there be. It's, it. And you say the same thing. It's just mechanics. Yeah. Subpoena me, Jim. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean. I think, I don't know, I, I, something might, I mean, I, 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 we'll take it under I, advisement. I, 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 I would suggest, so I, I don't know if you guys do it now, but in the old days under Mary, um, we had an agenda for the Ford Chairs meeting, yeah. like five topics to talk about. And if you're doing that, you could share that with the boards yeah. as a start, so everyone knows what was discussed. It's actually the responsibility of the SAU board chair to do that. Oh, that's the SAU board chair is the one leading the board chairs meetings. <laughs> well, it's not well. Yes. Can I? Do I? Yeah. It's usually, really. it's usually me trying to coordinate yeah, agenda. Yeah, it's items. usually yeah. Adam. We're all there to work on our agendas. That's really and when, to when uh, um, when Quinlan was was in charge. It was Quinlan driving the bus on that, but on the four chairs. It was a different superintendent too. <clears throat> Well, and to, yeah. and, and to that end, because that's a minority of the of the board, it's not a quorum. You could argue that if if George and Pim get together over lunch to discuss school board business, that perhaps they should take minutes, right? It's a sub it's a sub section of the board. No, I, I mean I just totally disagree with you. 
I mean, it's a conscious effort to come together and coordinate for the benefit of this town. I totally understand the justification. It's just as a board member, I would like to know what was discussed and um, I would like to be the most, be informed. Or, and I don't think it would hurt that the public would know what was discussed, but you should at least be sharing it with your rest of your board or boards. I know, but I, I think what I'm saying to you, Laura, is that we do. It's in the agenda because that's what we talk about. And then it's actually on Trello first. Yes. Yeah, and then that time we t we discussed, and I don't know if this is the, the thing that made you think this, is that the time we discussed David's comment about us coordinating our efforts between the four boards, we actually came back to the SAU board meeting and discussed it, and then we came back to this board meeting and discussed it. So it's not like, I mean, there's nothing in the law or statute that says we need to take minutes. And I understand it's more of an ethical thing about transparency, but there literally is nothing we're discussing that anybody, like, I don't know. It, it's just, I hate to say it's just added work for, for, for not, no benefit, but it's almost added work for no benefit. That's just my feeling. I don't know. But I'll, go, I'll go around the, the, the table just to see what everybody thinks. I mean, what do you think, David? I, I honestly have no opinion. Steve? I, 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 if I was in that four chairs meeting, I would view it as added work for no benefit. All right. Amy? Yeah, I would agree. I feel like it's on Trello. I feel like it's in the agenda. I feel like you can obviously, you know, whatever we're talking about is going to be at the board meeting. You can always call your board chair and ask if there's something specific. But it's, it's on Trello and it's in the agenda. So I don't – I know you made a comment that we were – strategically directing the district but that's just not true we're setting agendas so I felt like that was kind of implying that we were doing something without transparency which is just not the case do, do you so, uh, do you advertise the date and time do you put that no. on? all right okay just want to know I, I mean I don't know no like I, to do that. I feel badly that you okay. think that so I, I'd love to come up with a solution um, but really to, to plan our agendas and have us, you know, we, we made the commitment that we want to start acting, you know, together. And so this is just a way for us to know what's happening at the other board meetings and, you know, share information on our agendas. So I don't know. I, just, yeah. I don't know how to address your concern. I've never really given it much thought because as far as I'm concerned, it's agenda setting and I'll find out when I see the agenda. And then George. I agree with our concept, but if it's being addressed or shown in other areas, I don't want to create extra work. So I can go find it on Trello or something. I'm fine with it. But I agree with the, the concept. We should all be aware of what's going on as a board. But yeah, I'm not trying to create extra work, and I'm sure she's not trying to either. But no, she's trying to she's trying to get to transparency, which right. I yeah. understand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Would it would it matter to you, Laura, if um, it was a public meeting and anybody could attend it and observe and what you know, take their own minutes or notes or whatever? Would that would that yeah. get you someplace? Right, but board members can't attend because you know, obviously, we don't want a quorum. Well, I'm mean, talking about anybody from the public. Right, but I would think board members would be interested to know. Yeah, but board members could attend. It's just, you, you know, if you have, what, uh, less than uh, nine. four, what? Less than nine. If you, well, no, is it less? Or three or four of anyone board. Yeah. yeah, and then if we had, <coughs> we had two, like, oh, yeah. for now. Less than a, All right, so let's, if you, vegan board members, so if you eliminated vegan. that possibility yeah. of having nine board members show up, or, yeah. then, <laughs> no, just say that <laughs> you not that can't exciting. do it. <laughs> but you could make it a public meeting. I mean, you just, mm. could, if you did that, then I think. How, it, is this, how is this done in other towns with this configuration? <clears throat> They don't actually. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I don't know. I've not. I've not worked in a. I've worked in a multi-district SAU before, but we didn't coordinate the. In Pelham and Wyndham, the SAU board met twice a year. Wants to set a budget and wants to rehire the superintendent. So they don't. They don't do it. That's that's what I've been told. So let me let me do that. Let me look to see what they do in this configuration elsewhere. Yeah. 
just to see, just to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Would it, would it help if, if just the board chair, as, as part of our normal committee reports, said the four chairs we talked about, A, B, and C. B and or, C made the agenda this time. Yeah, I mean, Love certainly it. whoever's the chair next year can certainly do that. <laughs> 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 I nominate Laura. <laughs> um, all right. Motion to go in the non-public. I think I can avoid us going into non-public. Can you? Yeah. All right. Oh. Okay. So uh, last time there was a discussion of three retirements for, for staff at the end of 2021, so uh, 17 months from now. Um, so if, if you don't want to discuss the three people, um, I can tell you all three of them meet the age and seniority requirement for it. So if you can make them, you have to make a motion in public anyway, but we don't want to release the names of the people into the public. So it would make the most sense if the board could take that motion right now to accept the three retirement requests that have been brought forward for 2021 for right. policy GCBD. So these are the, uh, the staff who let us know by December 31st they, did. they intend to retire in June 2021. Yes, sir. Which entitles them to a small economic benefit this year, extra, and a somewhat larger, but still small in the grand scheme of things, economic benefit. Yes. Their final year. Indeed. And their names were shared with you in the last non-public, actually. Yes. I will make, move to accept the letters of resignation for the duly qualified staff members. Quantity three. Quantity three. Doesn't matter. As many as one can do it. Can I no ask? On this I thought we had a. I thought we had an arbitrary limit. No, th first. this but this so one. Let me see if there's a second. The, okay. The quick right. one-year one is a limit. All right. Do I have a second? I'll oh, second. All right. Second from Pim. Discussion. Laura. Um. My question was, are these the three, like we have three benefits potentially each year? Are they the only ones eligible? There's no limit to the number of people eligible to receive the benefit. Okay. So the three from last year was because three met the deadline? Yes. Okay. The, the three from last year really is what's going to retire in 2020? Correct. Got it. Okay. All right. Okay. So we have a motion, a second. Any more discussion? Okay. All in favor? All opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Any other business, Mr. Superintendent? None, thank you. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion. Second. All right. All in favor?